Dr. Martin, General Retired Hughes, Dr. Hogue, Dr. Maddy, Dr. Anderson, distinguished guests, and colleagues, guest speakers, and supporters of both the Combined Arms Center and Army University. It is my honor to welcome you all to the 2022 Army University Learning Symposium. I know it's been a while, but to thank you for making time to be here. Some of you have traveled pretty good distance. This is important, and uh, together as a collaborative team, uh, we're going to have some very impactful outcomes and deliverables. The future operational environment and the pace at which operations take place across multiple domains require innovative and adaptive leaders who can thrive in complex and uncertain environments. In turn, the Army must re-examine the way it trains and educates the force. Significant and rapid advances in technology demand a shift from an industrial age, one size fits all education to an outcome-based educational approach. This requires the Army to modernize the way it trains and educates its non-commissioned officers, warrant officers, and officers with a focus on the knowledge, skills, and behaviors graduates must have to succeed in future assignments. For those unfamiliar with its charter, Army University is a virtual, distributive, constructive, and collaborative learning environment that connects all professional military education institutions across the Army into a single educational structure. Our world-class faculty and professional curriculum are the core of our educational efforts. Our mission here at the Army University is to provide academic policy, governance, and innovation to enable the Army's academic enterprise to train and educate agile and adaptive soldiers, leaders, and the Army Civilian Corps to achieve cognitive overmatch to win in complex operational environments. This biennial symposium serves as a forum for professional dialogue to exchange ideas and promulgate the cutting edge learning sciences within military and civilian academia, enriching the learning experiences and develop highly skilled leaders capable of dominating on the battlefield in every domain. This year's symposium includes four major categories, modernization, people, talent management, and outcome-based military education. Over the next three days, you'll receive keynote presentations from Army leaders who will frame these important topics. So to kick off this event, please welcome my boss, Lieutenant General Martin, the Commanding General for U.S. Army Combined Arms Center, Commandant, United States Army Commander General Staff College, and the Deputy Commanding General for Combined Arms United States Training, Dr. Convain. Sir, morning, over to you. Well, thanks, Dave. And uh, first, I want to thank everybody who traveled from far and wide uh, to be here, and also to the team that's on Blackboard out in all stretches of the empire that's coming together for these three days to drive change and uh, help develop the way we train, uh, educate, train, and inspire uh, the next generation of leaders, both officer, warrant officer, and uh, non-commissioned officer. So when I uh, was selected to be the commanding general of the Combined Arms Command, I was very excited. Uh, I had served here uh, 30 years ago at, at CAC training, and I, I thought I knew what the commanding general of CAC Combined Arms Center did. I was just ra raring to go. And then I got a briefing that talked about the portfolio, and there was a title in there. Uh, that I really didn't, I had to wrap my arms around. Uh, I, I understand commanding general, I got that. Uh, I understand deputy commanding general for TRADOC, I got that. I understand commandant, I've had a couple of turns at, at, uh, at that particular uh, duty description. But it was that one, and it was uh, Dr. Jack Kim that uh, clued me in that I'm the executive vice chancellor of Army University. Now that one got me thinking that maybe they selected the wrong Martin out of the hat for that particular job. So I had a little bit of vapor lock when I uh, found out about that job, what the portfolio included, uh, but then I started to uh, uh, relax because the more I learned about what goes on at uh, the Combined Arms Center, but Army University writ large and across the entire uh, Training and Doctrine Command Enterprise, I started to understand that it's the underpinning of every single thing that we do beyond the things that I thought I was an expert on. 
educate and training and developing leaders at the branch schools, at the centers of excellence, and of course, what we do at the Command and General Staff College. So having been a product of all those, I never really understood how they came to life, what brought the rigor, what put the meat on the bones that was generating the, com the real combat power of our army. Uh, so uh, once I found out about that, I got very excited and uh, wanted to see where we're going. I'm about 14 months uh, into the job. I probably should have known about this because I spent 38 months at uh, Training and Doctrine Command headquarters at Fort Eustis. So quite a bit of time in the Training and Doctrine Command enterprise, but a relatively short period of time here at the Combined Arms Center. So what I intend to do is give you a... Uh, uh, basically a situational update on what I believe the operational environment is. I want to challenge you uh, to uh, drive, drive the necessary change, and I'm going to throw that qualifier in there, the necessary change so that we're developing the right type of leaders for our formations in the future. It's very important that we get it right, and I'm a big fan of technology. By trade, I'm an armor officer, so that means since day one, I've been immersed in complex mechanical uh, uh, equipment that requires uh, a lot of uh, training beyond just manipulating buttons and uh, moving switches. It's, you, you have to understand the system, and certainly that's the same for almost everything that we have in this modern army. But I also learned that it's, it's way more than that. It's understanding the why behind a lot of things that allows us to be adaptive and flexible on the battlefield. So let's talk about where the Army is right now. So uh, we find ourselves at an inflection point. We're very fortunate. Ten times a year, the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Sergeant Major of the Army come here and talk to the pre-command course. And they give us their vision for the Army, and they task us to make sure that we're developing ourselves and our leaders to be able to fight and win on that particular battlefield. The chief says we're at an inflection point. I agree. If we go back uh, to a parallel, it would be 1973. So coming out of the Vietnam War, think about this for a minute. From about 1965, where we were riding the wave of designing new units and new ways of warfare, think of uh, air mobility, uh, envelopment in the vertical dimension, breaking out of the mold of what, how we fought in the Korean War and how we wanted to fight in the future. So the application of that new uh, fighting concept, those new organizations, that new doctrine uh, really was pretty much all the United States Army did from about 1965 to 1973 with the withdrawal from Vietnam. And really, we could snap the chalk line in 1975 with uh, the Mayaguez incident. Now, during that uh, time period, and rightfully so, every single thing that the Army did in terms of uh, the equipment that they bought, the doctrine that they developed, the way we trained units, the way we conducted leader development training, the way we prepared ourselves for the future was all designed to fight and win in Southeast Asia. And during that time period, our adversaries, and that, at that time, Russia and the Warsaw Pact went to school on us. They, they figured out where we were weak, where we were strong, what they had to do to dominate, to get after their national objectives, and they made investments in doctrine, they made investments in equipment, they made investments in the way they trained, the way they deployed their forces. And in 1973, we find ourselves out of position uh, in Europe, unmodernized with inappropriate doctrine, and certainly without the type of leaders that we needed to succeed if we were, in fact, called upon to execute our Article 5 uh, requirements of NATO. So a couple things happened. So uh, the Army started looking at itself. So if, the first thing we need to do is look at ourselves, have a, have a clear picture of where we are, how we're organized, what we were. And at that time, the Army was out of position organizationally, and modernization to fight and win on future battlefields was completely stagnant. So a couple of things happened. But in 1973, uh, the Army reorganized 
and developed training and doctrine uh, and fielded uh, training and doctrine command at that time at uh, Fort Monroe, Virginia. A couple of other major commands, so the Army reorganized and those commands were started. So moving the deck chairs was very important, but really what it did is it started driving our Army into the future. And the first thing that happened was the sprint to get the fighting concept and the doctrine correct. So many of you probably are familiar with air land battle. What you're probably not familiar with are the number of iterations from 1976 to 79 to the first publication of air land battle in 1982 and then the final capstone doctrine uh, that the army accepted in 1986. But what that did is it started the army on a path that drove the requirements for modernization. So at that time, Training and Doctrine Command uh, was also responsible for uh, com uh, Combat Developments Command and the downtrace units that created what is uh, usually referred to as the Big Five. M1 tank, Bradley fighting vehicle, Black Hawk helicopter, some of the major systems that you saw perform so admirably during the first Gulf War in 1990. 1990, 1991. But really beyond that, there were some other things that I think were more important then, and I, I say this, but I don't mean it, I don't mean it in the wrong way. Um, we need the technology, make no mistake about it. We have to have the technological edge if we're gonna have to fight out number and win, but those are trinkets in the hands of amateurs. If we put them in the hands of warriors, we can, in fact, harness that technology, harness the fighting concept, and fight outnumbered and win successfully. So I'm interested in the technology, but I like to say I need the, I need the technology. Bring me what I need. But what I really want to get after is I need to create leaders of character that can take that equipment, that fighting concept, and fight and win outnumbered. And that's exactly what we did. And it didn't happen all by itself. Some of the major things that happened, and I, uh, I'm so old in the Army that I actually remember this. So there was a revolution in professional military education. The first thing that we saw is the non-commissioned officer education system was formalized, modernized, standardized, and it was propagated around the Army. It took a, it took a life of its own. It accelerated, it was adopted, it was embraced, and we started putting meat on the bones of the non-commissioned officer corps that had been decimated during the Vietnam War. So if you want to do some study, find out about what happened to the non-commissioned officer corps between 1965 when we had probably the finest NCO corps in the Army that was decimated through the nine, uh, almost a decade of uh, continuous combat. So the non-commissioned officer base was set and it was uh, put into motion. It was, it, was, it was a secret sauce, it doesn't get a lot of attention. The second thing that happened was a major shift in the way we educate, train, and inspire officers. So the, uh, the easiest example I can give you was the shift from one over 200. So big bedroom, one instructor, charts, it was a little bit more complicated than that, but it was based on the World War II Korea model, tried and true industrial mechanical uh, production line uh, development of really sound uh, technically and tactically proficient officers, but not necessarily the type of officers we would need that could uh, handle the new equipment, the new fighting concepts and the new realities of, of the battlefield. And then that was the advent of small group instruction. And then that propagated throughout everywhere. So here at the Command General Staff College, although I wasn't around, I did flip through the book when my father went here in 1968, and there were a lot of lectures in Bell Hall, a lot of lectures, not a lot of small group instruction. But what that did is it set into motion the education of our force so we're uh, creating uh, a, a more competent officer. We're, more, we're creating a more competent and grounded non-commissioned officer corps. At the same time, we're empowering them. The real magic came with the development of the combat training centers. Again, all this under training and doctrine command. 
So the instrumented after action review allowed us to take the education, the development of the non-commissioned officers, the influx of new equipment and new doctrine and test it on a tough, realistic battlefield. So we cannot underestimate the combat power of the combat training centers and the instrumented after action review. If you're not uh, familiar with what I'm talking about, prior to, and again, I'm so old, I experienced this when uh, used to conduct the Army training and evaluation program, the tanks would actually put uh, blue and orange uh, squares on the side of the tank with a number, and we put a telescope inside the uh, gun tube of the tank. So if you could see the number through the telescope in the gun tube you could, and on the radio, you'd get credit for hitting a vehicle. It's a lot of there's a lot of loose ends in that and it's not really very scientific and then enter the combat training center where we have uh, fully instrumented uh, weapon systems you can see the you can at, at even in 1984 you could identify high performing tank and eighth tank uh, crews based on the range that they were engaging based on their probability of a hit their, based on their probability of a kill and what we did was we're able to accelerate the combat capabilities of our individual crews, which enabled small units. With the appropriate leadership, those enabled units are actually much more combat effective than just plain numbers. So it's a marrying of technology, education, leader development in a on a tough, realistic battlefield. And you saw that perform so admirably as part of the joint force during the first Gulf War. So where are we at right now? I, I submit, and the chief you know, is leading us in this, is we are almost in the exact same place. So we've been riding on the backs of the modernization and the uh, leader development programs developed in the 70s and 80s that created the officers, non-commissioned officers that led us through the first Gulf War and then through the joint forcible entry into Afghanistan in 2001, and then the uh, liberation of Iraq in 2003. Now, I won't discuss any of the policy because that's beyond the scope of what uh, I'm here to talk about. I'm just talking about the ability of the joint force, in particular the land component, the army, to execute the type of fighting that they've been called upon by the National Command Authority. So, here we are from 2001, 9-11, nine, uh, 2002 into Afghanistan, 2003 into Iraq, then Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, all these other places around the world. Uh, certain amount of high intensity, large scale combat operations, the current lexicon, and then a shift to uh, counterinsurgency, stability, strike and counterterrorism operations. So really from about 2005, with spits and spurts along the way, our army was totally dedicated to prevailing in that type of combat. And so it created a plug from about 2005 to 2018, 19, uh, with uh, the uh, eventual withdrawal from those particular battlefields, where every single thing that we did was designed, every, every piece of equipment that we bought, Think about the uh, mine resistant ambush protected vehicle, about $9 billion. Our investments in uh, hunting and killing technology, think of uh, unmanned uh, aerial systems, uh, which we've been operating with impunity uh, up until now. And the doctrine that we used even here in the schoolhouse until about 2016, 2017, we focused ourselves to be able to understand, fight, and win a counterinsurgency or stability operations. So we have a huge plug with a national defense strategy of 2018 caused us to do the same thing. Look back at ourselves. How are we organized? How are we equipped? How are we educating our next generation of leaders? And what we found was we were out of position organizationally, just like just like 1973. So uh, we saw the creation of probably the most important thing that we've done in the last decade as an army. The 
laying the cornerstone uh, with the creation of Army Futures Command. An Army Futures Command is out there keeping their eye 20, 30 years into the future and developing the Army that we need and the concepts that we need to be able to fight and win in the war after next. Training and Doctrine Command uh, has got us covered out until around 2030. We will fight with the Army that we have now with minor uh, additions and subtractions out until about 2030. Army Futures Command is, is going to be delivering us capabilities and concepts that we will turn into doctrine that we will have to cr have the leaders created so that they can fight and win in that particular battlefield. Of course, the further out you get, the more fuzzy it gets. So we've got two guest speakers that are from Army Futures Command. They're going to talk about some of the, some of the concepts of the future. So where does that bring us? It brings us here to, uh, to 2018. So the National Defense Strategy of 2018 put us into motion. Army reorganized, bringing Army Futures Command to life, and they're still, they're still growing into their uh, full self. It'll, it'll, I don't know. I think it will take five to ten years before, we, before uh, the Army really gets it right with uh, not only organization but authorities. And... Uh, how we integrate with uh, other major commands and with the joint force. So we're on the cusp. Uh, so 2018 Army Futures Command, uh, at the same time, the multi-domain operations concept was inked and passed to TRADOC for development. Uh, since 2018, we've been working and are on the cusp of uh, publishing FM30, which is the 2022 version of what in 1986 was their land battle. We think we've got it about right. We already know that the base concepts are correct. The uh, Army is moving out on uh, the mechanical pieces that we need in order to fight. You've just seen the latest, which is the uh, approval, I think, for low rate production of the mobile protected firepower, which will bring uh, uh, additional capabilities to our light infantry forces. We still have to figure out how that's going to be integrated on the battlefield. So that's where we that's where we are right now. So what what is going to be the equivalent of small group instruction for 2030? The Army of 2030 is what I think we're getting after here. I think we're at a position of advantage in that respect. And you know, so in er with every disaster becomes opportunity. And I don't think anybody in their right mind would fight me saying that COVID, the advent of COVID uh, sweeping across our country and colliding with our army uh, was a, 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 a terrible event. But in that event, a lot of things happened. So from the perspective of training and doctrine command, we learned a lot about how we could, we could train differently, not because we sat around in a room and thought about it and started to experiment, we were punched in the face because we had to continue developing uh, leaders in the COVID environment. Just 12 months ago, when we convened the class of 2022 here, we could not put them all in the same room. I did not see their faces for probably six months, six to eight months. And they were just coming out of a full year of uh, remote uh, education. And did we get it exactly right when we first did it? I don't know. I just know that the entire training and doctrine command enterprise was forced without any prior warning, experimentation, concept development into remote education. And I'm sure that we could have done it better. But what we did learn was over those 24 months, we learned what worked, what didn't work, and what we could take advantage of. Now, uh, Army University, again, in my role as the executive vice chancellor, uh, we were directed by General Funk as part of the trade uh, campaign plan to modernize professional military education. The first target was the captain's career course. First target 
was Captain's career course. There's a reason behind that. When we went after leader development, uh, when the chief staff of the Army went after modernizing uh, leader development, leader selection, their first target was the battalion, but with the battalion command assessment program. So from TRADOC's perspective, in order to enable the battalion command teams, commanders and command sergeant majors, we must enable the captains that will command the companies, troops, and batteries for those battalions and squadrons. So our target was a captain's career course. Uh, after almost 15 years, uh, programs of instruction had morphed to meet the day-to-day -day needs of the battlefield. There was a lot of there was a lot of um, there was a lot of uh, work that had to be done to bring us back into regulatory compliance, and then the compliance with what the customer wants. So we took that opportunity to figure out what needed to be in the Common Core. Great work by Army University, uh, bring uh, the uh, Common Core down to a manageable piece. And then the, sec the secret of the really exciting part of this is based on lessons learned from COVID, we've determined that 50% of that could be done remotely with some of the new systems that have been developed in the past 24 months. And we're in the process of fielding that, the first uh, captain's career course, uh, a remote uh, education for the Common Core will be available in just a few months. October 1st, and we expect that our first modernized CAMS career course will take place in May or June of next year. Uh, so without getting into too much detail, we were able to free up about 168 hours of CAPS career course. We can't make the courses any longer, but what we can do is use our time more effectively, more efficiently to get after developing the leaders that we need to, to be able to fight and win. So what I want to share with you real briefly is that each, uh, you know, from my perspective, each of the centers of excellence took a different approach to what they were going to do with 160 additional hours of training they got. Some took the opportunity for a completely holistic review of what type of captains they would need. Some were not as aggressive. We're still in the process of approval through the Command and General of Training and Doctrine Command on what these captain's career courses are going to look like. But I think what I would pass to you, if I can only pass one thing, is keep an open mind as you uh, share ideas, as you discuss new concepts. If you keep an open mind, if you ponder what you hear, share, think, we can drive the necessary change. I'm really excited. I won't be here to see what happens on the captain's career course, but I'll be watching from afar. But I think we're off and running. And of the nine centers of excellence, I think five are going to make exponential growth. The other four, incremental growth. So I guess what we're really shooting for is harnessing uh, what we can from lessons learned, sharing best practices, and driving change. I think I've exceeded my time, Dave. But the second half of what I'm going to do is introduce our guest speakers. Uh, so Dr. Doug Matty, please raise your hand. So Dr. Doug Matty is the uh, director for Army Artificial Intelligence Integration at, at Army Futures Command. Uh, he's a graduate of West Point, uh, class of 1990, and he's a uh, uh, formerly air defense uh, officer, transitioning to be operations research analyst. He served at increasing levels and eventually helped to stand up the Capability Development Group in U.S. Cyber Command, where he served as its uh, deputy director. He also holds a doctorate in engineering systems from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His wingman for this operation is uh, Colonel Jason Zuniga. He's an Army Software Factory Chief of Operations Officer, I mean, COO, right? Uh, 
He's a 2006 uh, graduate of the United States Military Academy, and he's a graduate of the number one business school in the United States, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. I think his uh, mom wrote this. Jason is an aggressive and innovative entrepreneur with a warrior spirit and a heart for the profession. He uh, established the Army's first venture capital training with industry program and serves as a nonprofit board fellow. So uh, I'm really excited to see where you take this operation, uh, General Foley, uh, uh, Dean Kim, uh, in the next uh, three days. And I now hand the mic over to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and he's, he just left, so apologize for being a little slow, but uh, I want to thank General Martin for the great introduction and actually his leadership to pull all this together. Um, I think that you find, you know, as he kind of recounted, you couldn't have had a better setup for some of the efforts that we're going to be taking care of and discussing with uh, Colonel Zunigan and myself in terms of how do you actually prepare yourself for the upcoming operational environment. And that's really the, the key thing is you, if you listened or read any of the publications that have come out of Army Futures Command over the last three years, it's really been focused on what is that future operational environment and how do we prepare for that? And uh, so a lot of the discussions you've heard also centered around what we call the 31 plus four, the various initiatives, programs, you know, the technologies. And what I think you heard General Martin really hammer home, which we recognize at Army Futures Command is, you have to take that full dot mil PF P perspective. It can't just be purely about the technology. Um, and that's a lesson learned, as he recounted from the big five. And so when, when a guy named General Thurman was the vice chief of staff at the time, and he was trying to integrate and synchronize across all these platform systems, that were truly together going to provide revolutionary capabilities for what we called then airland battle. Um, it really tried to synchronize and pull those different pieces together of the material, the people, you know, how are we going to fight it, all those types of things. So again, that was just a phenomenal uh, setup that we had uh, to get prepared to talk about a little bit more of what we want to go for. Um, again, I'm, I'm the director for the Army's Artificial Intelligence Integration Center. The art is formerly known as the AI Task Force. Um, it started off really about the same time that AFC was being stood up. And so as a lot of folks were focused on how do we stand up this new headquarters, you heard the last significant strategic uh, sea change occurred in 1973 with the establishment of TRADOC. A similar type of event occurred in Austin in 2018 with the establishment of the new four-star headquarters with Army Futures Command. Uh, simultaneously, however, there were those already existing, the cross-functional teams. Those cross-functional teams, if you've ever studied anything about organizational uh, science, you know that over time, this, this thing that we have kind of a, I'll say a, a derogatory perception of bureaucracy, right, tends to stagnate, tends to create other types of dynamics. Um, and those that study it know that it's really called administrative behavior because what happens over time is folks that are very explicitly proficient in their respective task environments start to recognize there's opportunities to the left and to the right. And so they start to explore expanding those task environments and without in coordination of those other areas. And so pretty soon you have a bunch of folks doing everybody else's job, right? We have an undisciplined system, all those things that I know that a lot of folks in here, I see people nodding their heads say, yeah, that's kind of what happens after a while. And you need a significant change or some type of event to either change the perception, right? Melt the iceberg, if you will, and then allow folks to refocus on the mission because that's one of the benefits I think the Army's re recognized over time is that when folks stay mission focused, everybody starts to row in unison Right, we start to work together as a team, and that's really one of the key things that we identify. So, with that as the precept, 
along with those CFTs that were established to help pull together these significant portfolios, you know, i.e. the Army modernization priorities, you had a couple other areas that we identified that were critical, right? Assured position navigation and timing was one of the CFTs. Obviously, the network is instrumental to connect all of those systems together to be able to fight on the modern, modern battlefield. Um, and then there's this other weird one that we called the synthetic training environment, or STE, right? And so while most folks would look at that and say, well, that's just for training, right? Just as we used to say in the motor pool, you maintain to train and train to maintain. Same thing there with the STE capabilities, which you know uh, the, the former director for that, um, who's now the deputy CG at TRADOC, um, General Gervais, Lieutenant General Gervais, she recognized the option, the opportunities of training actually being integrated into operations. And so you truly were not training to, you know, training to fight, you were fighting with the training. Um, and so we saw this, the cross-functional teams start to pull things together to advance in their respective areas. Now, you heard General Martin also talk about the impact of the CTCs. And, and the reason that that was so critical, as he mentioned, was that you now were able to bring together the full complement of these capabilities, all the doctrine, the organizations, the materiel, the leaders, the people, et cetera, in that environment, in the appropriate context to see exactly what was going to occur. And so with that effort, you see the same thing occurring with those CFTs and other modernization, modernization efforts in project convergence. And so just real quick, anybody, I'll just quick show of hands, everyone around the room, who has, anybody not familiar with Project Convergence? Okay, so I have a couple. So again, what you'll hear in terms of the moniker is the Project Project Convergence is a campaign of learning, right? That's the way it's, it's, it's described. And the reason that we say it that way is because we're pulling together all of these various technologies, platform systems, and with operators, right, soldier touch points are essential to the development efforts. When we pull those together over the course of a year, where we kind of increase the complexity, the reality of the environment where these are operating. And so it may start off at the JSIL at Aberdeen, where we simply are connecting things for a communications exercise to see if I can pass ones and zeros, right? And then we progress up with that, things like edge, that uh, future vertical lift pulls together, where you can do something that principally is focused on one of the CFT areas, the air domain, right? But there's opportunities for others to pull together and synchronize and, and achieve what I call cross-functional synergy. And so we've seen that now over the course of the two repetitions that we've had with EDGE. And of course, with project convergence, where you have complete linkages of, and we can get into the discussion of the semantics, kill chains, kill webs, all of those, I'll say, interactions that occur on the battlefield that have to um, be pulled together to achieve the effects that we're looking for for our warfighters. And so Project Convergence now affords us that annual cycle to culminate in an operational environment. And I think you'll see that if you look at the progressions where the first Project Convergence was pretty much like a sticks lane um, for the respective technologies. And then the second iteration, it was not purely Army, it was actually bringing in our joint partners to operate and, and I'll say execute mission threads and, and joint mission threads. And that's one of the other significant things now is the lexicon of how we think about operations. We've known for a long time, as always, you fight as a joint partner or a coalition partner, right? But now the lexicon is going from things like army war fighting functions to joint capability areas or universal joint tasks. And those are the thoughts that we need to impart on our future leaders because that's how we're going to operate. And so by pulling those threads together and increasing the complexity, you'll see this fall with Project Convergence 22, you know, another ratcheting up or another increase in terms of the reality of where we have operational forces executing on the platforms that have been iteratively developed, fielded in the, the National Training Center, instrumented again for feedback and, and uh, assessment so that we understand what is the true capability assessment that's ongoing versus, I'll say, a purely technical uh, type of construct. So again, those are kind of the overarching things before I start narrowing in and focusing specifically on what we see as one of the most leading technologies that's going to have a ubiquitous impact across the force, and that's artificial intelligence. Um, when we got together for the first Project Convergence back in 2018, General Murray was the new commanding general. 
and we gathered all the senior leaders for AFC at the Fort Belvoir Officer Club to do, as typical, a big uh, tactical exercise with our troops, kind of the, the rock drill, if you will, on the floor map, where we laid out exactly what was going to happen operationally um, at the project convergence. And so the first thing that the general said when he stood up and addressed the room, he goes, look, we are on the precipice of technology fundamentally changing warfare. And those three technologies are autonomy, robotics, and artificial intelligence. And of course, everybody looked around the room and looked at me and said, how much do you pay the old man to say that? All right. And didn't have to pay him anything in a sense, because he'd been out talking with industry. He'd been out talking with academia. He'd been talking to folks like yourselves, thinking about that future operational environment and what is the art of the possible and how do we make that into the tactics of reality. And so by pulling all those aspects together at things like Project Convergence, you have an opportunity to take the thoughts, the, the big ideas, quote unquote, that you've been working and your students are working and developing there's opportunities to bring that together and, and shape that in a realistic manner that we can experiment, assess, and then understand, right? So now as we start to transition to think about, well, let's talk about one of those technologies. And, and to me, I don't see it as one of three. I see it as one leading the three. Because if you talk to me about robotics, I'll point you to the hallway and show you a vending machine. Right? Where you push the button, you know exactly what's going to come out. There's not a whole lot of interaction between that, that system and the environment or potentially the operator. Right? That's not the current state of robotics today. Roughly about uh, a little more than three weeks ago, we hosted 70 senior leaders from Army Futures Command in Pittsburgh. Right? The CG, um, the acting CG, General Richardson, has been up to see us multiple times, as you can imagine. And every time he comes in and we give him an update on the projects that we're working, I always take him around to see one of the companies, you know, one of the industry partners or one of the leading researchers at some of the local universities say, hey, sir, I just want to make sure you know, here's where that tech horizon is. This is where we are aiming. This is where we should be shooting for. And so after doing that to him several times, he, and then he travels back to Austin and he gets the requirements documents that we all love so much to read and write. And so he's looking through and he's saying, well, why am I talking about this when I just saw a company that's doing that? Why am I looking at someone that wants to go for this threshold when these folks over here, and it's not just the Googles and the Facebooks, right? There are a number of small, medium, potentially large size companies that are doing the objective level of capability. And so how do we get to that? Well, the answer is you have to write it into the requirements. And so what he did was he said, look, we got to level set the team. So he brought in all the senior leaderships, folks from, and I know you know the artist formerly known as Arctic, right? FCC, brought those folks in with the CDIDs, right? Brought a bunch of folks from the headquarters at AFC, brought in all the CFT directors, right? Um, TRAC was there. I mean, literally brought all the senior leaders together and said, we're going to go around and we're going to visit with some of these companies. Not because we're looking to see who, who we can write the contract with. It was really to, you know, assess that tech horizon of where we are today and where we could be in five years. Because as you heard John Martin say, folks are thinking about 2030. Well, 2028 was the original line in the sand, quote unquote, for where the chief, right, and the, and the vice chairman, and et cetera, I'm sorry, the chairman and the, and the chief wanted us to be 2028, right? But for AFC now, we're already thinking about 2030, but more importantly is 2040. Because the modernization efforts that we know are going to have to occur, not just on the material piece, but your part of this with the people, the training, developing those leaders, you're going to need essentially a generation, if you will, to get the, the force so that it's ready to do that. And so that's why we think about 2040 and where we're going to go. So to do that, we have a strategy with regard to AI and how it'll feed into the robotics, how it feeds into autonomy. Right? And, and actually, the other aspects that you can do with AI and how we pull that together. So those really fall into the published uh, strategy. It was signed out in 20, 2021. Um, the strategy consists of five lines of effort. First and foremost is you have to have an infrastructure. You have to have a foundation to build on. So there's a lot of folks that are helping us do this. Right, The CIO talks about the things that he's doing for the network. You have a chief data officer, Dr. Markowitz, who's been working on how to establish data fabrics. How do we pull together the disparate data that everybody has residing in their Excel file on their local machine, right? How do we actually get folks to operate in the cloud and do the things that we need to do? How do we curate that data so that it's not just something 
that you may be aware of and understand the metadata or the context in which it's been developed, but actually someone else can repeat and even reproduce that analysis and maybe potentially even improve it and integrate it into their work workflow that we need to have. So again, working through the data and the infrastructure is first and foremost, right? The second thing, and this is directly a result of the chief's guidance, right? No surprise, focus on the workforce. Why do we not have command and control systems that already have AI or intelligence systems embedded in them? Anyone hazard a guess? Right? I think that when you talk to the folks that are doing great work, the reason is, is a lot of them don't understand the technology. They haven't been exposed to it. They haven't been educated about what does it really take to have an AI stack that can you know, technically feasibly pull all that work together and allow you to have sufficient compute at the edge or I'll say at echelon. And so we have to have the workforce that knows how to build this. It's kind of a chicken egg dynamic if you think about it. Um, the third piece that we have in terms of our line of effort, it goes to those modernization efforts. And so when we pull the people, we have the, t um, we want to develop the doctrine. No one sits there and can just simply plan that out. That's one of the reasons why if you go back to 2013, you know, those crazy folks that run JSIDs, the Joint Capability Integration Development System, one of the things they recognize, nobody has all the answers. So why don't we give you some trade space to explore that, especially in terms of IT system software, et cetera, which is exactly the things we're talking about. So those information systems or ISCDDs that allow you to establish a trade space and experiment and work on those things to figure out where exactly what is the problem in some cases, and what is the better solution to go after that? And so that's one of the changes that's already occurred that we may or may not be fully utilizing in terms of our repertoire to be prepared for that net future operational environment. Um, but as we think through and iterate on that, the modernization of the platforms are gonna, it's gonna be significant. And I've seen this again, if you think back to where we've seen with those snapshots that I mentioned at Project Convergence. You know, for, first, for example, we have a project that's called Autonomous um, or Aided Target Recognition and Multiple Cooperative Autonomous Sensors, right? Quite the mouthful. We call it ATRMCAS for short, right? Most folks looked at that in the first project convergence and said, wow, that's really cool. You have a gator that can drive down a road, doesn't go off the road, smack into, you know, obstacles, et cetera. And it also has the ability through computer vision to identify tracks, targets, et cetera, and discern whether that's a a technicals pickup truck or a burned out T60 that happens to be on the range, right? That was the first iteration. However, the objective was how do I achieve going through, because how many folks in here can actually articulate what is multi-domain operations? And how would you know that you've achieved, quote, convergence that is a prerequisite for multi-domain operations, right? I'd offer to you that by going out to project convergence, in at least the first two terms, we've established, I'll call it a hierarchy, right? Obviously data is necessary, right? So data fusion, if you wanna say the math term, right? We say it's necessary, but not sufficient, right? You have to be able to share the ones and zeros. But the next piece up was where we start, as I mentioned, those mission threads, where we started to see system to system collaboration, right? No more swivel chairs. Right? I love my fire, my fire direction NCOs that are sitting there looking at the targets coming down. They pull it off a of JDOCs, right? They put it over an aphid swivel chair kind of stuff, and it goes forward, and we're actually engaging targets in a whopping 25 minutes. It's wonderful, right? When we get system-to-system -system collaboration where the ones and, flow, ones and zeros are flowing, all of a sudden now I'm down to about 25 seconds, right? That's kind of the change that you realize when you have – enabled and that's one of the jokes general martin mentioned too before we started i don't think you heard it he's like he's like maddie i need to make sure you guys are enabling me i'm just an armor guy right well we're doing that we're trying to enable our soldiers not replace them because again they're always going to be the central war fighting system that we have and so when you have linking of the system to system to collaboration and you get that war at machine speed all of a sudden things start flowing. You start to get the complexities, right? Those, those complex dynamic behaviors that you get where something is greater than the sum of the parts. And you see that with that next level that I mentioned earlier, cross-functional synergy. So a system to system collaboration occurs, enabling soldiers to operate at you know, a speed of warfare, increased levels. Now I can achieve the cross-functional synergy. So I have AP&T 
that starts to observe things on the battlefield that goes through an ISR task force ground station that feeds to a long range precision fires IRCA battery, then it generates those effects at much greater distances that they couldn't before because they just weren't able to be aware of what was happening out at those ranges. And so that's the kind of dynamics that we're seeing through project convergence and this, this feedback loop that we look for. And it really comes from the integration of the modernization platforms. And AI facilitates that because again, how do you have you know, analysts that are able to keep up with all of these new sensors that are out there, the, all the information flow, those types of things. It, it doesn't replace the analyst, but we're augmenting him by keying them and queuing them to very specific areas so they can say, yes, that is in fact the target that I'm looking for. Yes, that is where it falls out on the high payoff target listing. And let's execute the plan, mission, et cetera. The fourth thing that we talk about, again, if you're going to do that cross-functional synergy that I mentioned, you have to have partnerships. So each of the CFTs would work together, but not just the CFTs, the rest of the modernization team has to pull together, whether it's a CDID, whether it's our friends on the ASALT side with acquisition, because again, if the CFTs principally drive the requirements that we need for modernization, they have to be hand in glove with the acquisition folks that are going to continue that development and field these new systems. And so the, the partnership and the governance has to be adjusted as well. So the linear approach that we saw before, where you have your milestone A, milestone B, milestone C, that's great if you want to take 20 years, right? But we don't have 20 years. Well, not when your adversaries say they want to establish dominance in these key areas by 2030, right? And, and complete dominance by 2050. So again, I go back to having that governance structure where we work together as a team focused on the mission, and we can achieve these type of much tighter turns, much faster decisions, as well as the development that goes along with it. And then fifth, what's offered here is, again, if, as you look to enable our soldiers, that means there are automation processes, workflows, et cetera, that are doing some of the work that our soldiers previously, did, or I should say some of the tasks that were done before. We see that as a good thing in most cases because you're not nugging away, right? I can use that term to say, I don't have to nug away on that. I can let the machine do what the machine does best. Do simple calculations, do some you know, inferencing, some references, some recognitions, those types of things, right? But implicit in that is this notion of ethics and trust. And so the fifth line of effort that we have really focuses on establishing, um, and this was actually the first thing that the Deputy Secretary of Defense established when it came to AI was this idea of responsible AI. And so what are the steps that we have more than just the illities that you hear from a system developer or systems engineer where I have accountability, traceability, right, explainability, those are some of the terms that you hear. But more important than that is this notion of am I doing the right thing and am I doing the thing right? And that's what I mean when I talk about ethics and trust, because you have to be able to assure that that commander understands how to employ that system, because the commander is ultimately responsible for what happens in their respective area of operations. And so that fifth area, and, and you'll see it when I finally get to the slides, um, that we've actually embedded that into the framework. So. With all that as the pretense to what we wanted to talk about, we're gonna focus a little bit about the people side of this, the education of what we're trying to get after. So if you could go to the first slide, please. And again, at the risk of oversimplifying this, right? when we think about artificial intelligence, that's kind of the tip, if you will, of analytics hierarchical needs. right? I know a lot of folks are used to hearing the term hierarchical needs. Um, AI is kind of up at the tip of that. What we've thought about is, well, how do I build to that? Because as you know, most folks currently today, as I mentioned, are still trying to figure out how to share their Excel file, right? This is how do I have automated workflows across hybrid cloud environments at the enterprise level that allows for automation and, and um, recommendation systems and those types of things that you see in industry. And so what we've put together a framework just to kind of lay this out is the first and foremost thing is you have three simultaneous problems that you have to work on. One is you have to take care of the data engineering pieces. How do I have those ones and zeros flow that I mentioned that is necessary, but not necessarily sufficient, right? And so as we work through that, pulling in all the different sensors, having the different formats, things like message formats, right? These are, these are things that we 
we kind of say, well, the engineers will figure that out. Well, not anymore. When you go out to Project Convergence, I have commanders that are talking about, hey, the only thing I can receive is this particular message format. So where's the translator that allows me to have Because I need that information in a timely fashion. You know, you heard General Martin mention about, you know, as an armor officer, he had to think about complex mechanical systems from day one and how to keep them operating, maintain, you know, effective and available. All those things now, we just expanded what folks have to understand. You dare, I, I dare to say you're going to have folks that are thinking that I'm putting them through one of my courses in computer engineering, right? Because that's how those things talk. So that's the first piece that you see there with the sensors flowing in the data. How do you curate that? How do you manage the storage potentially of volumes? And I'm not talking just, you know, megabytes anymore, right? We're talking petabytes, huge amounts of data that have to be maintained potentially on the system. So I have to have sufficient swap C as we call it. Now this compute that we're talking about is fundamentally different as to what's on the platform. And then think about how do I handle that at echelon? Because not everything can go back to the rear area in some large data center in the cloud, right? The cloud, as you say, <laughs> clouds fly over you all day, right? So you may have the cloud wherever you are, just in a different size or swap form factor. And But that's the key is we're thinking about how to do this so that it's cloud native and you can access it from wherever you are. The next piece that we look at is going from the data storage over to the part that most folks want to talk about, which is how do I do the, the development or the analytics aspect of this, right? Again, most people think, well, to do AI, I just need data scientists. And I'll show you a chart in here in a little bit that lays out what really goes into a data science team, right? And all the different ro work roles that you have to consider. Um, what we've decided in early on is we said, first and foremost, the Army needs help on its data. And so rather than treat analytics or AI algorithms, as I'll say, as kind of an independent weapon system, we think of it as a team or crew served weapon. And so early on, we made the decision to have data engineers and data analysts, right? Now that offended a lot of folks because they said, well, I'm a data scientist and I can do all that stuff. But then when you talk to them, right? And, and this goes for industry as well. When you talk to folks in industry and say, well, how, how well are your data scientists doing? They say, well, they're not really happy because they spend 75 to 80% of their time munging data. If you haven't heard that term, mungins, trying to clean it up, you know, get it formatted, labeled, curated, et cetera. I said, well, don't you think you ought to fix that by having somebody like an assistant gunner or, I mean, data engineer take care of that for you? They said, yeah, that'd be a great idea. So we've done that. Um, in fact, as a part of our engagements with academia and industry across the country, you are now going to start seeing um, different universities establishing master's programs explicitly for data engineering. And we had a couple of those folks that did that. So we're continuing to work through that piece. And then, uh, and I, I don't want to steal too much of Jason's thunder. Um, and so I know he's going to talk about the software engineering piece and how you deploy this and get that in the hands of commanders and all the goodness that they can do with it. But again, we want to do it in such a manner that it's flexible because Folks that say they can design exactly the right interface for a commander, and I should say for every commander, are not telling you the real story, right? As you know, everybody sees things differently. And so building in that flexibility and agility so that we can tailor it to the needs of the command, the mission, you know, all of those other factors, we want to have that there. But it all starts again, as I mentioned, with the infrastructure and the computing environment that has to be present, much more than just having a digital overlay. Right. We have to have something that's smart. Um, so that's the key thing. And, and again, it's not just a one time flow as the, maybe the errors indicate. Right. It's iterative. You continue to improve. You continue to refine. Right. Again, based on mission, based on environment, based on adversary, all those factors come into play here that we have to continue to be flexible and agile. And so how do you get to that? Go to the next slide, please. What we saw is we, we went out and canvas industry best practices. This is roughly the 20 roles that they say you typically would find on a given uh, data science team that does these types of works. But again, one of the things that we wrestled with was, okay, we got to start somewhere. There's no way we're going to just kick out, you know, with 20 new roles across the Army. Trying to get one MOS, quote unquote, in the Army is challenging enough, right? Talk to our friends over at Cyber, right? So what we decided to do was let's focus on the ones that we don't already have in uniform, right? Because I know that I have this other component to the Army called our civilian workforce, 
which tends to be technically savvy, right? Tends to be very skilled in their respective job series areas. And so we said, do we have job series existing that can help us cover that? And what we highlighted here are those areas that we did not find either in the OPM listing or in the military occupational skills. And so that's what we highlighted there, right? The key thing that I notice here is, you know, data engineering is zero, right? And a lot of folks ask me that, say, well, why'd you put them as zero? Does that mean they're not important? I go, no, it's basically what you said. If you don't have your data, you're not doing AI, right? So that goes with, that's first principle goes without saying you have to have that capability. And then it flows from there that the data analyst, again, I discern the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist, not because one is better than the other, but the data analyst focuses on their aspect, putting rounds on target while the data engineer is feeding the belt for them, right? And then you can see the other ones are fairly explanatory, except that I'll highlight the one over there again, the AI ethicist, right? That's something that, again, I've been working now for three years to try and find that development path to see where I can find it. There's a few unicorns running around, folks coming out of say the philosophy department at West Point, um, other folks, some chaplains even have done some of that type of work. Um, so we're working through that to develop that. We have one major that uh, she's continuing to refine her pathway. She's our AI ethicist um, on the team. So we continue to work through that. But again, opportunity for some critical thinking and assistance from the team. Now what happens when you put all these folks together? The key thing that we try to do is build out our workforce strategy. Go to the next slide, please. Right, and this is where it comes together. So again, we're trying to do AI across the enterprise, right? There's some folks that are gonna focus on the team level. We're thinking about the entire enterprise that is the Army. And so there's, uh, you know, Mr. Phillips is my lead for non-material requirements. A lot of folks say, well, that means workforce, right? I said, no, he does much more than just workforce, right? It's all the rest of that dot mil PF that we talk about. But he talks about the inside game and the outside game, because what everybody likes to focus on is the golden triangle, right? A little Pittsburgh reference for you there. Um, but most folks think about the triangle. What they miss is the square, which represents the enterprise, i.e. the army, right? And it all starts with leadership. And so that's what you see at the top on the right, is we have kind of stratified the work roles that we're looking for. We have the leadership, because that's what's gonna drive it for us. To leverage that, we've kind of run several pilots in terms of courses to pull together. Again, knowing where we are in the maturation scale for AI, it's focused on data-driven leadership, right? So it's not an AI course. It's how do I get the value, the benefit of data by using data-driven leadership? And so that's the course that we've developed. Next is the professionals. That's where everybody thinks of when they think of the hotshots in Silicon Valley, et cetera. So those masters, PhDs, right? the engineer, that ML engineer type of folks that you think about. What we've seen is that we've, again, I already highlighted the notion of the data engineer and the data analyst working side by side, but a lot of times they focus in the virtual space, right? How do I take care of General Martin with his armor officer or, or those folks, the infantry guys, right, that want to go, you know, pull the trigger, right? That means folks have to operate and these systems have to operate in the physical space. And so for that, we've identified autonomous systems engineers. Right now, it does not mean that they're always full autonomy. There's a spectrum, as we know, that you can go from teleop to having semi-autonomy where there's interaction and then ultimately full autonomy. And so we're working through to develop those autonomous systems engineers. And yes, I think you will find them at division and core level because those are the kinds of capabilities that you're gonna have resident in those formations. And they're gonna need to adapt it because if someone tells you that they can develop the system that's good across every mission set for the Army, Again, they're pulling your leg, right? Don't buy any land from them. You're gonna have to have someone that can tailor it to that operational environment, that area of operations, right? And for that threat and adversary to update. Um, so those are the top pieces there. Now, again, what's different about this than you see most industry folks is they, they stop at that professional level, right? But we know what really drives the Army, right? We affectionately call them the backbone of the Army or NCOs right, in those technical experts. So we have the AI technicians level that work to take what the engineers put together and then implement it, kind of like the affectionate term we use is master gunner, the AI master gunners. And so what they started off doing was folks said, well, where am I going to do all this development? I need a cloud, right? Everybody wanted to build sandcastles, but nobody knew how to build the sandbox. That's what our AI technicians started, right? They were built in terms of establishing these cloud in, in, uh, 
instantiations and put those together, right? But then as they started working through the projects and said, how are they going to use this when they get to the field? We had to upgun them even just a little bit more. So they've taken some data engineering um, certifications, some programming certifications, and, and various types of cloud instantiation. So they're not just tied to one type of uh, cloud infrastructure. So again, very robust capability that you have there. And the best thing is they speak Army, right? They understand employment. They understand about mission. And that's what our warrant officers and our NCOs are doing. So again, always looking for great folks to come participate in those programs. We take them in. We use them for two years at utilization. So now they actually know how to walk, not just do the talk. And then we're sending them out to units as they build up their respective data science teams uh, to employ these capabilities. Though, then probably one of the more important ones, again, is the bottom one. Is As we said before, we're looking to have AI-enabled systems online by 2028, 2030. The question is, is do you really want a force that doesn't start to think about that till that time frame? So we're getting ready here this year to start kicking off an AI users pilot. Um, what that does is that teaches, uh, it's roughly about a two-week course is what we're going for, so 80 hours where folks can do it via distance learning, get on there and then work through understanding what is the difference between raw data and a curated data set? What, how do I understand when an algorithm is operating with intolerance or when it's making you know, biased types of recommendations or the data may be training in, uh, inappropriately? You know, those different kind of factors is what we're pulling together. The scale on that is again, across the army. So whereas you had um, roughly about 50 up in the professional level, another 50 at the technicians level, we're talking thousands at the AI users thing. And so as we work through these couple iterations, we'll continue to scale that. And the, again, this is all part of a broader .mil PF perspective in terms of the capability development. And it, I think it's important to understand. So for us, for example, right now, 50% of the requirements documents that we're generating are DCRs, right? And so they're, they're that exactly what you see at the bottom there on how we're doing that. Um, I think that that, wraps up all the slides that I have. And so I just want to check and see, I think there's an opportunity if folks have some question or answer and, and maybe I'll give you an answer. Otherwise I'll leave it to Jason to clean up. Hey Doug, I got a question for you up here in the back. What, uh, how are you using or are you using AI to help you pick that construct of a team that you just showed on that slide? I mean, I understand you're trying to build an AI task force and teams, but how are you making sure that you're calling and parsing across the force, both civilian and military, the right people to be on those teams? So again, it comes, goes, goes back to the data. Um, so one of the very early projects that we had was helping HRC as they were implementing the marketplace, if you recall back to the AIM, AIM 2.0. So one of the first things that we did was look at what data they actually had that was available. And as you can imagine, it's fairly small. Um, it was fairly uh, uniform in terms of the types of data you had. I mean, there's only X number of MOSs, right? There's X no or Y number of positions that folks may have held. Um, and it, what's interesting is with the advent of what we have in terms of text analytics and natural language processing, you would like to have more data. But what we found is, especially on like OERs and NCOERs, we're actually getting smaller and more concise. And so we're not able to have as rich a data set to analyze when we start to look at those things. Um, what's helped with that though is, again, back to the question, with the AIM 2.0, folks have an opportunity to fill out that resume. So there's a lot more richness, if you will, in terms of the data that folks can pull together. Now, again, it goes back to HRC um, and you have to talk to the folks that generate the requirements for AIM 2.0. Um, I know we've been working at IPSA because that's one of the things that folks are also looking at is how do we enhance the data set that's being collected so that they can run these types of analytics against it to pull that together. So what I'll tell you is uh, going back to that initial work that I mentioned, there were several different algorithms that were considered as to how you would do that in terms of make the matches between the individual the unit, and then of course the assignments officer who's trying to manage that portfolio or that that career field. Um, and so again, where are you going to develop the next CG for uh, Army Futures Command? What's that pathway look like? Um, and so those are some of the questions that we're still working through. Um, ARI, as you know, has been working skills, knowledge, attributes for decades. Um, we continue to work with them, hopefully to 
accelerate some of the goodness that comes out of those types of things. And I think that this is an opportunity for folks that are here while they're working through their stuff. You, you have experience in terms of those, I don't want to say soft skills, but those tacit types of capabilities that our soldiers have. Those are the kind of things that we need to leverage and pull together. And we have the folks that are smart enough to do it. We just need to get that alignment. And that's why you saw on the um, Teams chart that I showed you, originally those decision makers or functional experts. To do this in an isolation with a bunch of smart folks that know how to write code and develop algorithms is not very useful. You have to be co-located with the functional experts that say, I know what the problem is, or at least I think I know what the problem is. And together as they iterate, they refine what that um, trade space is and how to get to something better than enables them to accomplish. So hopefully I gave you enough of a hint as to the direction we're heading. I, I would like to say I had the answer, but we're still working it. Any other questions? Hey. Hey, sir, we have one from online. Yep. Uh, Mr. Brian Cook uh, asks, how do you scale your tactical PC successes through AME teamwork? AME teamwork? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so again, that, that's why I go back to that whole um, notion that it's an annual cycle. So we continue to build upon the successes of previous um, project convergences through collaboration with the CFTs, and then also, as I said, working through with the rest of the modernization enterprise. Now, one of the things that's different again about this upcoming PC is there's actually an expanded opportunity for industry partners to participate. While they may not be directly at National Training Center um, engaged because again, with soldiers, et cetera, there's, there's a much longer lead time uh, to an extent that it takes for safety releases and how to build that into the scenario and employment concepts, et cetera. Um, what they've started to do is allow mature technologies to come out and be demonstrated at a different location so that now we can accelerate the planning because we're already starting for PC 23. That planning's already underway. And so by having some of those demonstrations and experiments that are conducted at, at, as part of PC 22, I'll say plus, um, it helps accelerate the incorporation of those other capabilities into the next year cycle. Good afternoon, uh, Major Fortuna, uh, Army University. Um, I really appreciate your time. M my question is with the AI users. I'm thinking through that and looking to the left of that. So like, what are the prerequisites someone would need to successfully complete that course? And does that signify a gap in you know where the enterprise is as far as like basic computer science skills? Like, I just wanted to see your thoughts sure. on that problem. Set. Yeah, so there's no prerequisites for the AI users, right? It's supposed to be for your 001, right? That it's Everybody's going to be, we, we make the assumption, probably should have stated that up front, we make the assumption that AI is truly going to be as ubiquitous as the promise it is, right? And so we expect that to be whether you're a logistician, whether you're an armor officer, whether you're an aviator, whether you're a medical, um, you know, service officer, AI is going to be supporting you because I've seen already where those are underway, the developments of those capabilities are there. So there's no prerequisites for that. Um, with the AI technicians, in fact, um, that's one of the things that I continue to wrestle with the folks that are conducting the courses. That should be for any NCO, any warrant officer. However, I will tell you, it's fairly rigorous. Um, again, as we went from three certifications in the first cohort to six certifications in the second cohort based on what the demands were to work on projects and be interacting with the engineering level or the professional level folks, um, there, there are some, you have to show up knowing kind of and have those aptitude. You don't have to know how to program, but you have to have an aptitude for that. And that goes, again, goes back to one of those research questions that we've been working with ARI and those types of folks is how do you know when someone has an aptitude when they come out of, you know, Fort Living Room, quote unquote, and may not have been exposed to those types of things. You hear, you know, Jason will tell you lots of stories about the unicorns that he's uncovered, right? But that necessarily won't necessarily scale across the army. So the thing that we're trying to work through is how do you identify those diamonds in the rough, right? They just need that opportunity to be put there and, and get, be given that education opportunity. I appreciate your answer. Um, I was just thinking, because there's a thread about like computer science mm -hmm. and like, you know, K through 12 being a gap, you know, if you saw any gaps, like even at the recruiting sure. side. Yep. Yeah. So I, I'll tell you, I get accused all the time that, uh, you know, again, as you heard John Martin mentioned in my uh, my biography, right? Um, they they wear me out all the time that I'm a ring knocker, right? I'm not wearing it today. 
Um, and, and what I mean by ring knocker is that you know, a lot of the folks that we brought into the scholars program have come out of West Point. But there's a reason for that. So when you look across what the Army has assessed, almost all of our STEM, you know, STEM officers that have STEM backgrounds in their undergraduate education at the levels that would be admissible to these types of programs, right, they're mostly coming out of West Point. We only have a handful that have come out from ROTC programs and other universities. And so that's one of the things um, that we're continuing to work through with our partnership. It goes back to partnerships. Right, talking to cadet command, talking to recruiting command. Right, there are a number of pilots that we're we're exploring, trying to put together. Um, it's just as you can imagine, between COVID and what you know in terms of our accession uh, challenges now. Right, they don't want too much of that dust getting sprinkled. But if you think about it, this may actually be something beneficial to them to attract new and different um, demographics. We think. So. Thank you so much. All right. Yes, sir. Hey, Dr. Matty, my name is Rick Kelly, and I work in the college's uh, dean's office, and one of my primary roles is faculty recruitment. I've been thinking quite a bit about using artificial intelligence to attract and recruit from prim primarily our civilian faculty, and I thought about the chart that you had displayed earlier with the three components, and I've actually begun some conversations with Salesforce and MuleSoft to try to find a way to use artificial intelligence to identify uh, potential members for our faculty. So my question to you is, are you familiar with any other DOD organization who's doing that? Or do you know of anyone in the civilian sector who you think might be able to enable me on that? Yeah, so Thank there's you. several companies that we've talked to. In fact, we, um, we're sponsoring a CIBR effort um, in conjunction with ASALT to look for those types of existing industry technologies. Um, and so, uh, Mark's back there. So, I mean, I'm happy if you want to follow up with us and be part of that effort as we work through that. Because, as you know, there's a phase one where you kind of do the concept and phase two potentially, you know, where you actually implement and, and test it out. What I will also say is uh, if you talk to the 75th, 75th has some some uh, systems that they put in place for talent management. I mentioned IPSA, the team up in G1 has worked through that as well. Um, it, it goes back to this idea that we need to, you know, you need to be able to lift up the hood, right? And that's that's something that is kind of the antithesis of what folks like to do when it comes to acquisition, right? Especially in software. And again, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. I'm, he may or may not bring it up in, in the next session. But telling a PM, hey, we can help you actually make that thing faster, right? I can add that turbocharger to your, your straight block eight. Right. They may or may not be open to that or they may not even be able to because of the contractual obligations that the government and the performer have. And so that's this. That's why I say going to this, this different approach of agile, flexible development, I think, is going to have to be something that we look at. You know, and, and again, I know DAU has classes on agile. Right. But as you know, there, there's a big difference between teaching folks and having them implement those concepts and ideas, and that's one of the things. But to your point, um, the other thing I would offer to you is, again, it's really, really hard to stay current. If you want to stay at the at the front leading edge of these technologies, um, it's really hard to be separated from that. That's one of the things that we've learned by being immersed in that. That's why AFC is immersed in, in Austin, to be a part of that what they call ecosystem. So, you know, we have it with, you know, multiple universities, multiple um, startup companies, as well as some larger industries. If you look around Pittsburgh, I mean, I have the Google, I mean, their, their entire, uh, most of Amazon's Alexa work is done right next to the Steelers training facility on the south side of Pittsburgh. You know, most folks don't realize it because, you know, they're busy going to the practice facility versus sitting next to the Cheesecake Factory that's across the street from where the Amazon folks are. But those are the kinds of things that you have to be a part of the mix and do that. And so there may be opportunities for either temporary um, partnerships where you bring folks in to have them do something for a year or two, or distance learning now is a point where you can have folks remotely teaching some of this material. And they are the thought leaders in the world is, is what we've seen. So, and it's not just in Pittsburgh. I mean, that's, that's all over. You just, we can help, you know, help you know, facilitate some of those discussions. We were talking with, uh, with the War College, in fact, on the data-driven leadership course, because it just so happened the timing there perfectly matched what they allotted for their electives 
um, thing. And it, without, if it hadn't been for COVID, we probably would have been able to pull the trigger. But again, we're continuing to look at that and happy to discuss with the folks here because we're all one Army team, right? So, all right, I think we've got time for one more. Yep, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Ben Goldberg, DevCom Soldier Center. Um, you know, as the synthetic training environment comes online, uh, shift towards distributed learning for PME, more instrumented ranges. Where do you see AI fitting into the human performance training education space? And is your group prioritizing any of those research areas? Yeah, so we, we try to track pretty close what you're working on up there in terms of both the lethality aspects as well as the performance of piece. Um, and so again, the, the thought that we have on that is that there's already a number of industry examples where folks are just doing phenomenal progress in terms of the performance side of it. Um, and I know that we've, we've worked with the soldier lethality folks as well as with the STE folks previously with things like IVAS and how they're integrating that capability with the soldiers for lethality purposes. Um, just the key thing is, I'll give you an example. So one of the, one of the projects that uh, we, you know, when folks come to visit us, we have a number of folks that are located at the National Robotics and Engineering Center, right? And so when you come over, they get a chance to go down and, and I call it walk in the petting zoo, right? But it's a number of projects that they've developed in the past, you know, 20 years or so of, of doing advanced robotics and automation type of work based with AI. Um, and what they found was there's a, I won't say the name of the company, but there's a, there's a company that produces combines. And, and it was really interesting from a technical success story that they developed a combine that based on how it was real-time data feeds of how it was harvesting and the health, if you will, of the crop, it automatically adjusted almost 10 different um, control mechanisms to optimize you know, the, the harvesting that was going on. And so for most of the engineers, they thought that was the greatest success ever, that this fully autonomous combine could go through and maximize their crop harvesting. And then some rascal back at the headquarters for this company realized, you know, we just got all the data basically for all of the harvesting for North America. And so why don't we start building models about predicting crops and, you know, we'll call it that next level up, that that broader sense. So imagine going from the platoon level to the core and saying, now I can tell you, I can predict the outcome of the battle, quote unquote, because I've collected all this data as I go. That's that's where I think the real opportunity lies when we talk about soldiers, because, you know, I again, going back to the early 90s, what was the mantra back then? Every soldier is a sensor, right? That's great, but you have to get the data. And so how you efficiently compute and, and analyze that data doesn't necessarily mean the hub and spoke model, right? The, you know, every, there's two books everybody used to read back in the day, right? Net Centric Warfare and Power to the Edge. And the problem was everybody read Net, Net Centric Warfare, which basically described a problem and they failed to read the second book, Power to the Edge, which gave you the answer. I would just encourage everybody, go get the answer, right? And think about it where you're fundamentally changing the architecture, if you will, to go from this hub and spoke model to do what we've already figured out for our people, which is decentralized execution at echelon via mission command. And if we can make AI smart enough to do mission command, you'll achieve some of the results you're doing for the soldiers, but more importantly, we'll get all the convergence that we think we need. So again, thanks for the opportunity to come. Hopefully some of this was helpful, insightful, useful. And if not, that's why I have uh, Jason Zuni to come tell you some really smart stuff. So this guy's phenomenal. I've been uh, coaching him for about 10 years now. So when he tells you war stories from being out in uh, Silicon Valley, you can you know who to blame. So thanks much. Yes. Awesome. Louder. There we go. All right. All right. We're there. We made it. Um, good morning, everyone. I uh, am Major uh, Promotable Jason Zuniga. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks to uh, General Martin, General Foley, Dr. Kim. Really uh, honored to have the opportunity, and, and thank you for the uh, kind words, Dr. Matty, as well. Um, I am uh, originally part of uh, the Stand Up of Army Futures Command headquarters in Austin. I uh, kind of branched off 
as part of this stand-up of the Army Software Factory. I serve as the Chief Operations Officer there, um, one of the co-directors, myself, and the director, uh, Colonel Vito Errico. Um, only out of curiosity, because we are probably one of the newest organizations in the entire Army. Uh, by show of hands, has any, anyone not heard of or understand anything about the Army Software Factory? Totally fair. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Lots more hands than, than the previous question. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'll be as quick as I can, understanding that uh, we are short on time. Please don't hesitate to give me the hook at any point if we need to, but I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. Really, um, General Martin and um, Dr. Matty talked about so much that you know I, I, I would love to echo all morning long, but what I'd love to do is talk about the Army Software Factory as an organization, what it means for technology, what it means for people, and how we have interwoven learning and, and essentially kind of this idea of learn as you do and do as you learn uh, throughout the organization and, and what we do. Um, so I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. I'll try and get some opportunity uh, at the end for questions. Um, but really the Army Software Factory is, is part of this um, continuous birth of what Army Futures Command has become, right? And so while the, the, the command, the ACOM is still you know, solidifying what it is and how it interacts with the Army and as we've talked about, you know, prescribing and preparing for that future operating environment, the Armory Software Factory is, is very much aligned with exactly that, right? So as you think about some of those MDO uh, tenants and capabilities and the capability that we're trying to develop for uh, the future Army, some of those skill sets are exactly what we're trying to get after. And so as we think about it at the Army Software Factory, it's about organic, agile software development. And what I mean by that, right, is is we're not saying we're going to uh, to do any and all of it, right? We have an entirely powerful and, and well-educated and capable force within the uh, Army Civilian Corps that does an incredible job with software engineering. We have incredibly powerful partners that we contract out with as an Army um, across industry. We're not going to try and, and take all of that away from anyone, right? There's so much room for software engineering, capability development, applications, and tools that we'll never be able to do all of it. We just want to have another club in the golf bag that allows us to have organic capabilities for developing those, you know, time sensitive, regionally aligned to an AOR type capabilities um, when the time matters. And, and what I mean by that is exactly like we talked about, you know, as, as it gets fuzzier when we look 10, 15, 20 years out, right? We can't prescribe exactly what all the problems we're going to need to solve at Echelon, at the tactical edge are. But what we can do now is start preparing and having those skills developed within the green suitor workforce as we get ready for that future operating environment. So the Army Software Factory, as I said, one of the youngest organizations we were established uh, just within the last two years. We had our first cohort, and we'll talk about the personnel model just uh, in a little bit here. First cohort arrived in January of 2021. So in COVID, um, just over a year and a half ago, and we've been kind of sprinting ever since. Um, as I talked about, part of our mission is to um, prototype a future force design and also to empower soldier-led teams to assess and, and scope loosely, loosely defined problems on that future operating environment and help create solutions that empower our operational teams and our operational commanders in order to make better informed decisions um, at the speed of relevance and, and, and technology, right? So um, all that said, this isn't necessarily um, something that, you know, we just came up with on our own. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that there's so much information about what we need to do, how we need to do it, what we should be doing not just as, as an army, but as DOD, right? And for those who aren't familiar with the term uh, of software factory, we didn't create it. It's not our idea. Um, but it's about people, tools, and processes all underneath the same house, leveraging rapid capabilities and, and technology. Uh, a lot of it, everything we do is, is cloud-based. Um, but to help create synergies of, of development and scared, um, shared skill sets. On the DOD side, right, industry has been doing this as well as DOD. Uh, for those who are familiar, if I said Kessel Run, uh, that would be kind of like the first rendition on the Air Force side. Um, and if you're not familiar, there's some really cool and unique kind of origin stories of that. 
out in the, the Kayak and Cutter and, and the application called Tanker Planner um, that really helped save a lot of money for the Air Force. But we kind of took those concepts as, as we were looking at some of the capabilities that we need for the future, right? And we think that that, just as we, we kind of heard from Dr. Maddie, right? There's so many pieces of, of unique skill sets that you need to have, um, and just like foreign languages, right? People need to be practicing those and need to be adept at those, um, you know, more so than probably a side hustle. And so being able to, to start enabling organizations to work with soldier-led teams, enabling soldiers to, you know, perform on those teams and start utilizing uh, technologies in a new way that we don't necessarily have, <coughs> excuse me, have built in uh, to the Army's kind of repertoire right now uh, are, are what we think is going to help us pre prepare for and have those um, capabilities when we need them on the future uh, battlefields. Um, again, part of Army Futures Command, you know, that is a unique mission to AFC, right, is prototyping those future force designs. And so what we're doing is we're working hand in hand uh, with operational and generating force units across the Army, really as, as we're training and doing, right? So it's, it's just as much kind of like a, an operational unit as it is kind of like a, a training uh, ground for uh, what we have is, is four distinct roles that we bring individuals for, software engineering, platform engineering, product managers, a little bit different from project managers, as well as user designers. Um, and so for us as an organization, one of our, our values is, is continuous learning. And so part of the struggle um, with not having something fully vetted, planned, laid out within kind of like the Army force management structure is that we don't necessarily have all the, the blueprint, blueprints and definitions to a T for what these teams look like, right? We think they're going to be modular. We think they're going to integrate with data scientists, data engineers, all of that, right? But rather than wait for all of that to work itself out through the Army planning process, we said, let's get out there and do it. Let's build, measure, learn as we do. And so that's exactly what we did. And, and so we essentially started with some of the data points that we talked about just a little bit ago, right, that we don't really have a database that says, here's all the soldiers that know Java, JavaScript, React, .NET, whatever, right? And so we kind of leveraged our own pathways to be able to find and identify those self-selected soldiers that are looking for the opportunity to work on collaborative teams. They have the attitude and the aptitude. They understand things like empathy. They, under, they have grit and resiliency, because those are the types of characteristics that we need for the individuals that are going to thrive on these types of teams. Um, and while we have it kind of as an organization, we're, we're centrally located in Austin, right? And if COVID taught us anything, it's that there are capabilities that we can do at distance. So we are serving as sort of a general support model, right, in the way that as our product teams are practicing, training, operational, uh, operationalizing, right? They're working on active army duty problems. Why should we work on, you know, imaginary problems or things that, you know, are, you know, we're making up or, or, you know, are fake problems, if you will, when there's plenty of organizations, units that have capabilities that we can help put into the hands of soldiers uh, now. And so, arguably, the applications and tools are a bit of a byproduct, if you will, um, but they are a central piece of the capability that we're developing. Um, next slide, please. So real quickly, I'll talk about um, the pipeline itself of the program. So very new, still, like I said, we don't even have any like kind of complete graduates of the program, if you will. But in building the program as part of something that the Army understands, right, something that fits within the systems, we have a three-year broadening program that program takes in individuals relatively ranked, grade, MOS, agnostic. So we've brought in everything from PFCs to majors, infantrymen, engineers, signaliers, medics, all across the board uh, as part of our biannual cohort program. So in line with the Army move cycles, right, every summer and winter cycle, we bring in a cohort of 25 military soldiers as well as up to five DA civilians, because we think that 
all of this comes together as part of a heterogeneous team where you have resident experts from across all these different army domains, right? You have civilians that arguably have some of that expertise already built in too that maybe they're looking to, to learn this new method of agile, right? And as I talked about, right, everything we do is cloud-based, everything is agile as we build towards a, a rapidly deployable minimum viable product, MVP. The, the key part of all of this is the people, bringing in the right people. And so we take a, a pretty robust approach to the, uh, to the recruiting process as we talked about, looking for those specific and unique skill sets that people might already have. Individuals that might have taken classes in, in high school, they might have been a CS major in their college program, they might just be wanting to you know, be a technology enthusiast on the side. Some of these soldiers have actually been creating applications for their battalions. They just get shut down because they have no way to deploy it onto the operational network. So what we're doing is helping to create blueprints on the technology side that allow us to rapidly deploy on an operational network, meeting all of the, the various requirements with regards to compliance, cybersecurity, and, and allow us to not recreate the wheel every time we want to do something new. And so it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of work. We're working hand in hand with the Enterprise Cloud Modernization Agency, which is part of the headquarters CIOs team. And with ECMA, we help run what is called CREATE. And so in the C Army environment, if you're familiar with that, there's a um, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment capability uh, pipeline called CREATE. And that's a suite of tools that enables software development organizations um, like DevCom, like PMs, PEOs, operational units like all of your cores, and everyone else who kind of wants to help leverage cloud, leverage agile development in a better way, our team is half of that kind of create um, contribution to enable the Army in a better way. Um, as I said, we bring in all those individuals that can help contribute to these different uh, roles that we, we called out earlier. Um, such a foundational component of being able to, one, ingest data, and then be able to kind of like take the output of data in a, in a format that is usable and consumable for operational commanders, for users. Um, it's important for us to kind of have those building blocks of software. Um, so as we bring in individuals that have such a various background, of like widespread uh, is we kind of alluded to, right? Whether it was uh, in high school, whether it's self-taught, et cetera bring them in, we quickly run them through what we call a technical accelerator, much like a modern day tech boot camp, uh, four to five months. Level sets everybody, gets them so that we can quickly throw them onto a, a uh, operational product team. Uh, and as you can see, kind of like that, that second phase there is what we call the one-to-one -one SME enablement. So we have contracted subject matter experts, just like we would at a rifle range, where you're shoulder to shoulder with somebody who knows that the, uh, everything about shooting and can tell you about breathing and trigger squeeze and everything. We do the same thing. So you're already on an operational team. You're working with a contracted Silicon Valley engineer or product manager or platform engineer or user designer. And so those teams start as basically like a 50-50 half, right? Soldier led, but continuing to learn and rapidly upskill and enable while solving a problem. Learning as you do. And so we think that's, that's part of what helps us kind of continue to rapidly upskill or reskill individual soldiers and gets them to the point where we can then say, awesome, now you've kind of done this, you know, phase one and two, you can take an ASI exam. We've already gotten approved additional skill identifiers for these different tracks. You get an ASI exam. We've also tied in uh, service obligations with that so that we can continue to build and learn. Um, and understand how these teams can continue to, to develop as we prototype that future force design. And the Army doesn't lose out on that talent that we're, we're helping to build. They get their ASI and then they can start pairing with other soldiers. And then we have created that pathway for, for much as we often do, right? Um, train the trainer, soldier-led development, soldiers in the future hopefully teaching soldiers. Um, and then obviously once they finish that phase, they're still part of the Army Software Factory for uh, the remainder of that time period. Much above my pay grade, right? Um, the Army is trying to figure out and continue to assess what this looks like for individuals that are going through programs like 
AI2C, like the Army Software Factory, and how we continue to learn as an Army and implement them in ways uh, that allow us to assess and identify exactly what those you know, potentially modular operationalized force designs look like for um, the eventual Army of 2030 and beyond. Um, I think I'm probably out of time already, but I want to open it up to a couple of questions, um, if that's OK. And, and I know I, I went pretty quick, um, so I, I am sure there will be a few. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Michael Holt. Uh, I'm the director for distributed learning for the Army, so I run the Army Distributed Learning Program. Uh, we're, we're composed of a couple of elements, uh, so we do research to find products for distributed learning. Uh, we manage, oversee, the, and approve all of the Army mobile applications that are published. Uh, and uh, we have cores, and we do contract management for those programs. We also look at the certification, of course, we're on the Army Learning Management Systems. I'm curious about the potential for collaboration between the software factory and the DDL, because uh, it sounds like uh, there's some synergy that might exist. I'm just curious to your thoughts on that. No, I mean, we're absolutely always looking for the right partners uh, to, to collaborate on problem sets across the Army, right? I think for us, um, the people side of this is so important. The technology side is arguably sometimes easier than easier than the people side, but then the partner side is just as paramount, right? And so, um, yes, I think is is probably a, a short answer, right? Open to the possibility and discussing what that might look like. For us, there are a lot of organizations that arguably want to to leverage the same type of development pathways and and capabilities, and so some of this is is enabling other organizations to be able to do on their own. Some of this is taking the small kind of finite resource of the soldier-led teams and putting them against problems. And so arguably part of our struggle is that, one, we have to find problems that are, are best fit for those soldier use cases. Two, that it aligns with kind of um, our, our senior leader's approval. Um, and three, we're, we're definitely not trying to recreate any COT solutions, right? Well, like we talked about earlier, um, whether it's personnel type uh, capabilities. I think one that I didn't hear mentioned earlier was Gideon Soft, which I think is one that maybe SFABs are looking into as well. Um, but all those different things kind of contribute to helping select the right problems uh, for the soldiers to be able to work on. But yes, sir, please reach out and we'll discuss. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I'm Gordon Roy from uh, Cyber Center of Excellence, Learning and Innovations. Uh, to go along with the question uh, that Distributed Learning asked, um, we're aware of where to go out and find those mobile applications that they develop on the TADLP websites that they have out there. Where would we go to find out what software has been developed through the Army Software Center? Yeah, so that's a great question. So it's uh, not quite up on our um, page yet, but what we're working on is what that kind of digital library looks like for the applications that our soldiers have helped create while they're um, you know, undergoing these types of, of, of team assessments and whatnot. So uh, our website there uh, will have it in the near term, right, where you can go and see the different applications. And, and I intentionally didn't talk too much about the actual applications and tools themselves today, um, but everything from uh, applications like PMCS, how do we kind of extend the last digital mile of, of GCS Army and, and PMCSing and helping um, to digitize that in, in a BYOD solution in the aisle for uh, domain. I think, you know, working on things like, um, we call it, uh, the app is called Carrera, which is a way for extending um, the capability of uh, National Guardsmen and reservists, soldiers, to be able to see the active duty job board, which was previously locked down by IL-5, meaning got to be on government furnished equipment with your CAT card and everything to be able to access. Most guardsmen and reservists don't necessarily have that. Uh, it was a problem. Congress helped, uh, helped the Army identify that as well for those who didn't hear. Um, but we were already working on that problem because we knew it was something of value. And so we took the existing HQDA G357 program of record, right, and we extended that to be able to be in an aisle for uh, accessible environment. Um, as, as part of that, so you can now have reservists check that uh, from the comfort of their own couch at home, right, once they set up their account. Um, but it all meets the required Army 
network and cyber requirements. But to your point, we'll get that up there. Um, right now, it's a lot of what we do is uh, partnered with organizations and specific user groups, um, just as you get to that MVP. And so as we roll more and more capabilities out that are government-owned, uh, code base, government-owned data, all of that will essentially be available. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I'm Deanna Hanley from the Research and Analysis Center. And I have a question um, with regards to the Army-wide talent pool mm -hmm. and those DA civilians. What strategies or what tactics are you guys using to recruit these civilians? Are they outside the Army and becoming Army civilians, or are you recruiting within the Army? Thank you. Yes, so another wonderful question. I would love for it to be both. Um, the way that we rapidly set up the program, how we kind of didn't have um, the civilian programs in place to be able to maybe leverage civilians in as efficient a way as we can leverage soldiers, so to speak. Um, we executed what we kind of call command-sponsored uh, civilians, and so those individuals are basically coming to the program as part of their owning command um, and, and still resident as part of that organization. That said, we're working with ACMA and, and we're trying to co help convince them of l leveraging some of the existing Army programs and creating some new ones. So we just brought in our first Army interns uh, as part of the traditional Army intern program, and we are also going to be opening up uh, Army Fellows Program billets uh, to individuals that wish to, to basically use it as an entry gate opportunity uh, into the, the DA civilian core. And then they can obviously, post program, find themselves able to go out and take these skill sets to existing Army organizations, especially for those that are trying to you know, recreate how they work and develop into a more DevSecOps or agile uh, focused um, pathway. The uh, next step is hopefully maybe we can find our way towards a CETA medium type program that allows existing DA civilians to take part in the program, not on their commands billets, and then continue to find ways uh, for them to either you know, upskill, reskill while they're part of the program, and then branch out to uh, an organization that would be interested in their talents from there. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, Keith Perskins. What are you, or are you, doing anything in the institutional space? Um, so. Clearly, our focus is on developing the individuals through training and education. Um, so is there, is there anything that you're looking at from the perspective of tailorability or, or ways that we can measure learning we're not currently measuring through this AI space? Over. Yes, sir. I think one of the incredible things that I, I didn't actually mention, and I apologize, is that we are actually co-located with Austin Community College. and um, you know, coming from maybe a, a smaller town, uh, this community college is not like the one that I grew up with. It, it is very robust in what they do in Austin. Uh, over, I, I believe they're at 11 campuses. We are co-located in their IT uh, hub campus near, right next to downtown uh, Austin. Part of that kind of contributes to to the OJT type um, capability that we're bringing together. But to kind of come back to your points is. Um, we're working hand in hand with them for the continuous assessment and learning of the accelerator and the other types of uh, program of instruction that we have uh, throughout our program. One, not only to just make sure that you know we're both continuing to be front of mind and, and leading practices, um, because both of us also integrate with industry as best we can, but also to achieve credit and certifications to the soldiers that are coming through the program. Um, one of the few community colleges that not only has the ability to bestow associates, but also bachelor's degrees in small scope and scale, um, but that fit in line with exactly what our soldiers are, are doing in the program. And so they'll receive a certain level of credit and then be able to, to be um, you know, largely halfway, if not more, uh, towards a degree or certificate program, depending on what they're seeking. Um, so we're working with them to try and help identify how that um, is assessed and, and valued and then kind of leads to additional um, certificates or whatever that might be for soldiers. On the industry side, we're actually uh, much like AI2C. Um, not everything has to be contractually based. We bring in a uh, lunch speaker series every week. Um, industry experts from Austin, I'm sure everybody can think of a favorite tech company, uh, and they're probably in Austin, um, and we've had so many of them. 
uh, that just want to come out and, and bring technologists that want to talk about some of their best practices, some of their design patterns, some things that they've been seeing uh, across user design uh, and how it's morphed, whatever those different technology kind of um, uh, industry experts want to really kind of share with us as a, as a growing community. Um, and so that's been an incredible opportunity as well. Any other questions? So we're uh, relatively new, like I said. Um, hopefully, um, you'll continue to hear more and see more about uh, the different opportunities and partnerships that we're um, kind of picking up across the entire Army. I'll throw out one of our, our unique opportunities that we just had um, is the ability to have a soldier-led product team as one of many teams, but as part of the um, Army training uh, program with regards to ATIS. And so in, in part with, um, obviously, CAC and some of the uh, PM for ATIS, uh, we'll be working with that team as part of like the more traditional acquisition pathway. Um, again, to just show and demonstrate some of the capability and the operationalization of um, organic agile software development with regards to, to green suitors. And so I really just appreciate your time today um, and want to say thank you. Uh, let me set the stage for the next few hours. Um, what we have now on the schedule is something that we call collaborative breakouts. Um, there are actually four classrooms. If you go to the main level and straight down the hallway, there are placards that uh, show you four different classrooms where you can break out any time during uh, the symposium with small groups or anything else. It's, it's meant to give you a private space to talk about things you may collaborate on, et cetera. Um, it's primarily intended to allow people to, to network and communicate and, and share different ideas and different projects they're working on. Um, following that, we'll have a lunch break. Um, our lunches are an hour and a half because we have a limited uh, ability to be able to feed you in this building during the summer. Um, but you have options here. You can go over to the um, Post Exchange. They have a food court. And we also gave you a number of options uh, in your packet for, for off post. And then when we come back and reconvene at 1300, we will go into our first iteration of concurrent presentations. So one presentation will be here. There will always be one in Marshall. And the other concurrent one directly above us is the Arnold Conference Room. That's where the uh, other concurrent sessions uh, will be occurring. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please come down um, and ask me. Be glad to talk to you about anything. And uh, enjoy your collaborative time now. And um, thank you.
I mean, I don't know if it'll be beneficial or not, but I mean, that, we can see this and that way I can maybe at least, if, if I need that. Then we move into the I just want to let you know we have uh, 59 participants online currently. Hello and welcome. This is the Making Learning Visible Roundtable. I'm Dr. Angela Karish and I'm your moderator for this session. We all have many things in common and one of them is that we are all still learning. We have to be learning because our world is changing and it is complex. When we are grappling with complexity, cognitive overload can exist. And one broad approach to support our learning is making learning visible. We know that learners can engage in cognitive offloading by representing some of the complexity externally. And those external representations also support communication of complex ideas, allowing for social learning, collaboration, and synthesis. This session is about how the tools and theories associated with making learning visible help us address the challenges of outcomes-based education. We have the special honor today to hear from four experts in different fields of learning, innovation, and practice, and I'm excited to introduce you to them. Please take a few minutes to review their bios, which are posted with the symposium agenda. 
we have Dr. Jack Kim. He's the Chief Academic Officer with Army University and the Dean of Academics at CGSC. We have Dr. I'm sorry, Mr. Scott Brownrigg from the Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center, Dr. Matt Broadus from the Command and General Staff College, and Dr. Jacqueline Duddick from the University of Kansas Achievement Assessment Institute. They're here today speaking from different levels and different fields about what they have done to make learning visible. Please hold all your questions and comments uh, for the discussion until all four speakers have completed their brief remarks. We will have plenty of time to have some great discussions started after the fourth speaker. Thank you and let's get started. So we're gonna start with Jack Kim. Can you start us with some remarks regarding how we can use visualization to identify requirements for what needs to be learned? Okay, thanks Angie. Next slide, please. Now, every one of our speaks, every one of our talks has this kind of similar slide. It'll show the challenge, the uh, model method and tool, and then how why it works. So everyone's a little bit different about what our scope is. But the challenge I'm trying to address is how we uh, look at outcomes when, the, when even the term outcome is not clearly identified, and then how you do uh, what you do with it once you've defined what an outcome is. And our model that we use, or the method we have, is a design approach. Uh, which is very similar to what you do in operational planning, which I'll show you in a slide. And then it works because it helps the faculty and the students to see how we've shifted from input-oriented curriculum to an output-driven curriculum. Okay, next slide. So the first piece is uh, exactly what's the terminology? And the terminology has uh, varied a great deal, and uh, there is not a universal understanding of what they are, but I will tell you the terminology we use at the Commander General Staff College and now is being used uh, by the joint staff across the uh, military education uh, enterprise. And the an outcome is uh, knowledge, skills, dispositions, or knowledge, skills, and uh, attitudes that result from an educational program. It's the end state. It's what a graduate can do upon graduation. That's what an output is. So it's the same thing as an end state. And then uh, we will, you'll find there's that's these things we call program learning outcomes. In, uh, in professional military education, which means when a student's here for a year, then what's the uh, program learning outcome and what can they do, what do they know, and what can they perform? Whereas an objective has to do with what you learn in the class. So in a classroom, objective is normally characterized by an action verb and uh, by a Bloom's taxonomy. So it's, a, it's what a person can, uh, can do with, um, it's the level of performance a student can perform upon the completion of that learning activity. And these nest. So if I'd have you in a class, uh, then I'll have a learning uh, objective and I'll say, uh, this is what you're going to do. You're going to demonstrate to me, which or apply a certain function. I'll teach that course. It'll be against a Bloom's taxonomy. It'll be what's in that class. An outcome will be at the end of the entire program. When you graduate, what could you know, uh, demonstrate, uh, what are your what is your knowledge, skills, behaviors? This is kind of important because rather than looking at exactly what we're teaching, we're trying to look at what the product is that's being taught. And it shifts that focus from inputs to outputs. The next slide will kind of show uh, how we've looked at this. Next slide, please. And this, is, I know, is a kind of a complex chart. But uh, if you look to the left, the left is what we call the target uh, audience analysis. And we look at the students, but when they walk in the door, you know, what is it they can, they can, you know, what is it they can do, their knowledge, skills, behaviors, attitudes as they walk in the door. We do that by looking at uh, pre-tests, uh, by their assessments we have, by analysis, by knowing what they did, academic preparation, by the Athena testing that's being done, or by Nelson Denny, and uh, in the uh, captain's career course, the uh, GRE results. But it gives us a picture of where the student is as they walk in the door. We also can look at uh, what was the outcomes of the previous professional military education. So if we know what the outcomes were for the captain's career course, I have a pretty good idea what the inputs are for the uh, Command and General Staff College. So that gives me a picture of where they are in design, the current conditions. And then we look to the right, which is the target outcome analysis, is what do we want them to do when they graduate? What can they, uh, what do we want students to do when they graduate? Mastery of these program learning outcomes, 
you know, they'll possess certain attributes and they'll, and they'll have some skills, skilled communicators, critical creative thinkers, and we define those with very clear standards. And then in the middle, we have this gap analysis, which says, okay, now to get from where they are and where they need to be in graduation, what do we need to teach? What are the topics we're going to teach? And then what are the resources we have to do to apply that? And that is kind of the macro view of how we're going from inputs to outcomes, with the whole idea focus being on what can the graduate do whenever they graduate. And this is part of what we have briefed and what we do the curriculum design every year. And then what you'll see is our, around the top, we have what's called environmental scanning, which means we also draw what, a, what somebody needs to know based upon what we're being told to do by the environment, what uh, the stakeholders tell us what they demand a graduate to look like. So rather than teaching a bunch of disparate subjects, we're trying to produce a product that meets certain standards based upon what the stakeholder is looking for. So that's the macro view of uh, what we're doing and, and how we use design as a methodology. So now I'll turn over to you. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for setting the stage um, for the discussion. And now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Brownrigg. He's going to speak from his experience with the Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center, becoming one of the first law enforcement training centers in the nation to use an entirely competency-based education model. Scott? Thank you, Angie. Uh, next slide, please. So if you'll notice on there, the, the challenge that I have faced is visualizing how multiple abstract topics relate and can be introduced, reinforced, and assessed. Uh, the model method and tool that I will speak about is the backward by design model, um, which basically you start with the end goal in mind and work backwards to fill in all the critical components that students need to learn along the way to achieve competency. Um, and then how and why it works, <clears throat> excuse me, building blocks and relationships will become more apparent for the learners and for the stakeholders um, with bird's eye view of the mission. Uh, I've written out what I wanted to say because uh, my task was to try to condense three and a half years of the, or three and the last three and a half years of my life uh, building this curriculum for the Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center. So I'm, I'm trying to keep it very succinct and brief. At the Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center, we have recently moved to a new curriculum and a new teaching and training methodology. The old KLETC curriculum was taught in a siloed fashion. Teaching in a siloed fashion means that you teach each topic as a purely standalone topic. Because of this, students did not have the opportunity to link topics and concepts, sometimes, sometimes considered to be unrelated or unassociated. An example of this would be two key topics for police officers taught as separate classes, such as the class communication and the class officer safety. Prior to our curricular change, these topics were taught as standalone classes. They are now taught in a way in which the students can see, either in a performance rubric, performance rubric or in identified learning objectives or both, how safety can be a key component incorporated in communicating with people and vice versa. For example, when we talk about communications, when we talk about dealing with people, we talk about safe distances and things like that. It is no longer talked about only in communications, it's also talked about in safety. It's talked about in pedestrian stops. It's talked about uh, cross-curricular fashion in numerous different classes. With the assistance of the team from, from the University of Kansas, of which several are, are here on the stage with us today, uh, we were part, with several of the uh, panel members are here. We have also created several topic, several different curriculum maps to help our KLETC instructional team visually identify how their topics tie in with other portions of the curriculum that were once standalone siloed topics. So for the, method, or the model method and tool, um, next slide please. As far as the model method and tool we use, the educational concept of backward by design and the tool of fishbone diagrams that you can see here um, on the display to determine how to build competence in our police recruits. We started our entire curricular rebuild process by identifying core competencies of police officers. To do this, we relied on job task analyses from several different states to identify what we found to be seven core competencies. And from those seven core competencies, we derived 36 sub-competencies. <clears throat> we then used almost every one of those 36 sub-competencies as the targeted end outcome of our backward by design fishbone exercise work. 
we did this to visually create every concept and all of its component parts to be covered on the path to competency in a particular area. Next slide, please. This one, I realize that you cannot see uh, what's, what's on here, but take my word for it, the big box over to the, on the right side, the, the end goal, that is the communications competency for the, for the police officers. And all the stuff that exists on the ribs is what is built along the way to help them achieve competence. Since everything is now taught in a cross-curricular fashion, meaning that we no longer teach standalone concepts, we can identify similar instructional points within each fishbone and determine how to best introduce, reinforce, and assess those instructional points. For example, one of the ribs on the fishbone diagram of the competency of communication that you see here deals with the general concept of safety. In this instance, it is safety as it applies to the act of becoming competent in communicating as a police officer. But we know that the general concept of safety is also covered in other competencies such as handcuffing, vehicle stops, juvenile intervention, community caretaking, etc. We can determine which of the classes mentioned so far we introduce safety in. If the class community caretaking comes before communications and we know safety applies to each, we can introduce the concept in the first class, reinforce it in the next, and then all other subsequent classes. By doing this, we can show students, faculty, and other stakeholders where concepts are introduced, where they are further discussed and practiced, and how they are built upon through the academy and across topics. This sequency allows us to create a building block method of instruction for our academy students. It gave them opportunities to have important competencies and their component parts introduced and then applied to other areas, giving them an overall better understanding of how all the important parts of policing tie together and are dependent and interdependent upon one another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Brownrigg. And um, uh, we'll move on to Dr. Matt Broadus, um, who's gonna give us the instructor's perspective on um, how to get um, students to see their own learning and how, as an instructor, you the instructor can see their learning. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I would also start with uh, uh, an admission that this is the only place I've ever taught. I've taught uh, School for Command Prep, and then in, in the leadership department. Uh, so you're gonna get a um, uh, very much influenced by, by that. And, and I'm gonna take the ELM and uh, talk about how to expose learning uh, with the students. And, and I think that is perhaps the most significant challenge is to uh, get highly qualified learners to expose what they know, what they think they know, what they don't know and what they may want to know uh, in a very positive environment where they're willing to um, to uh, express and try out ideas and then for their peers to provide input in a in a way that is developmental that, that we kind of herd these cats towards the objective and, and i would submit that the elm and i'll show you a picture of it and and its role in this is a is a way to do that. Um, and our, our students have, have great experience and the ELM is designed by theory and by practice uh, to take their current level of understanding based on their experiences, what they think they have done and, and help them transition that into, into new knowledge. Uh, it's it's student-centric. Uh, there's only one phase of this that the, the instructor has the lead in uh, so what our job is to create those conditions um, and to, um, it, you know, to maximize participation, their participation and limit, limit lecture. Uh, and I think we have two uh, underemphasized um, uh, phases of this and I'll, I'll get to it with the, in the next slide. So this is just an example. I got the five phase ELM in the middle, which you, you really can't see, but if you, this is all open. Um, our, there's a, a really, really good guide, uh, Army University um, Learning and Instruction Guide, and, and you can 
you can follow that. Anybody that's a graduate of this course or of most of the other Army courses uh, recognize this. So it's it's not new, uh, but I think there are some under uh, some underrepresented areas. Uh, first is the uh, well, and uh, a model is the sum of the parts. So so they all have to be interconnected. In this case, uh, starting in this class, which is from uh, an elective I teach on resilience, um, it's a it's a concrete experience, a video uh, that that I. I think I would suggest our challenges students to get out of, it's just different enough to cause some uh, creative abrasion, followed by a discussion in which students are willing to, to challenge the ideas, challenge their own ideas. Um, a really good class is, is not like ping pong, me to the student, me to the student, but it's more like pinball, where the, the discussion goes around and they, they challenge each other. Uh, and then that spills out into the into the hallway, and that is essentially, a, I think, an operational view of making learning visible. When we evoke thinking um, and get them to in a in a very safe environment to uh, to challenge what they know, to um, uh, in the positive sides too, the 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 insightful, accurate parts of thinking, and then hey, where do they expose biases? Um, egocentric thinking, perhaps, and then they, they're self-correcting. And I think the ELM does that, the, um, and starting with the publishing process and then getting into the uh, application of the theory, and of course you can, uh, you can get that. This, this is specifically a, a theoretical model uh, represented by that ABC, uh, and then a description of the practical exercise. But then moving on to the, the, uh, the develop, how do they value, how do they describe how they value what they've learned? And that's different than the, uh, the apply, but trying to get and pull out um, a, a discussion of, of the values and how they're thinking over time. It may not happen in a, in a discrete, uh, even two hour lesson, a hundred minute lesson, but you know, how has their thinking changed as a result of the, uh, of the topics uh, over time, down to the philosophical level, how how philosophically have they changed? And this, it's a it's a starts with a skill, which I think would be mappable uh, because it's a discrete skill that then they can uh, they can branch out. Um, and so I would just uh, summarize with that's the I think there are opportunities in this in this five stage model to get students uh, to. Um, reveal uh, what they know and, and make this learning visible, which we can we can then evaluate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Broadus. Um, the experiential learning model, I think, is very powerful for um, making learning visible. So I think it's a great one for any any questions on ELM. That'll go back to Matt. Um, and now we'll move to Dr. Jacqueline Dudick. Um, she's going to share her experience with the development of tools to support mapping complex learning at multiple levels. Jacqueline? Thanks, Angie. So as a learning scientist, I'm really interested in this idea of, thank you, of how we move novices to experts, right? And how, that ex how expertise is developed, how it's shared, and also how expertise is developed um, or is situated in particular environments, environments that have specific tools, materials, people, possibly weather, um, topography, and so on. So that is kind of my challenge, turning experts' tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge for novices, and that is through making their thinking and knowledge and learning visible. A theory that I find essential to workplace and professional learning is called cognitive apprenticeship. I love this theory and I could talk about it all day, but I only want to focus on, on one of the particular features. Um, but I think cognitive apprenticeship is so important for competency-based learning because apprenticeship is, is competency-based. So cognitive apprenticeship, as I said, has many components, um, but what I want to focus on today is this treatment of content. So when we are talking about content, we're like, yes, those are facts, those are skills, I know what that is, but within the cognitive apprenticeship model, it also brings in heuristics which are the tips and tricks that masters have in their head um, that they've learned um, through uh, often uh, hard knocks and, and difficult experiences. 
Um, but also control strategies. So how do you solve problems disciplinarily or in that situated uh, learning environment? And then also, you know, how do you learn things quite quickly um, that aren't necessarily de uh, dependent on discipline? So taking this, this theory plus the method of learning maps um, is particularly powerful. And our center has developed a repertoire of visualizations uh, working with KLTC as, as one partner. And so this idea of mapping, mapping learning is a way for that we can not only map content, but map these heuristic strategies, these control strategies. And by asking different people to map what they know, we can see how the structure of a master looks quite different than a structure um, uh, of a novice. And what mapping is important is that you're not just putting pins in a map, but you're drawing roads and connections between. So uh, understanding how competencies reinforce each other, it's the relationality and it's the connections between that we're really focused on. And so I have two visualizations um, of uh, learning maps. Uh, next slide, please. And they both center around a project we did with cybersecurity. So the first map is the map that was created by experts. It looks like a framework. This is how an expert's um, uh, quite succinctly, um, and it's, it's very clean and neat, show this process of purple teaming uh, or purple team in cyber defense. Now, uh, next slide. Okay, this was my attempt, not knowing anything about cybersecurity, to take an undergraduate cybersecurity class and map it. Do you see what a mess it is? That's what our novice learners, that's what their, their structures of this knowledge is, right? They don't know what they don't know. And so if we just take this um, idea of the master's structured knowledge versus um, the uh, novice's unstructured or, or complex um, idea, we can start to say, okay, how can we move to something more ordered? How can we move to something more nuanced? Or how can we say, you know, if everything is important, nothing is important. And by mapping this, we can help ourselves as educators, as industry leaders, and also as learners to really focus and kind of make sense um, so we are not lost. No one likes to be lost. And we want to make sure that our learners, as well as our educators, stay found. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, and I think that we can start with our questions now. Um, we have, like I said, a few different perspectives here. We have uh, the, starting with a big picture of, you know, what do we need to learn? What are the requirements? And how do we know what the requirements are? And then the sort of um, instructor perspective on how do you know if your learners are learning? Um, the tools and technologies that you can uh, use to map out um, what needs to be learned in what order and how they're organized and structured. And I think that applies to both Jacqueline and Scott's, um, the, the tools and techniques. But I think everybody here at the panel could probably answer any of the questions related to making learning visible. Um, it kind of depends on what kind of questions you're going to throw at us, though. So um, if there are any questions um, that you all want to start with, um, and then we can also take the online questions as they come at us, too. So let me just throw it out. Anyone have a question to get us started? Yes, please, go ahead. OK. That is an excellent question. <clears throat> so the folks who teach for us at the, at the Law Enforcement Training Center, most, pretty much all of them, have extensive years of law enforcement training, law enforcement background. We have a couple of folks on staff who are actually attorneys, and they, they instruct the legal classes. <clears throat> so when we started teaching in a cross-curricular fashion, even if somebody was, say they were a, a, the vehicle stops expert, they then realized that even though they were an expert in vehicle stops, they were also an expert in communications. 
They were also an, an expert in um, safety on the side of the road, things like this. They were, they were so, so much of an expert in the field. It wasn't just that they were able to teach vehicle stops. It was they, then they were able to bring all the other items to bear within that class to support it. Now, we also have a very strong support structure there at KLETC, where if somebody doesn't feel confident in something they can teach, I guarantee you there's somebody on staff that's, that's an expert in it, and they can go to them and basically glean knowledge from them. Uh, one of the ways in which we made this cross-curricular is we no longer have learning objectives that are solely within that class of vehicle stops. We use the abbreviation VS, imagine that, for vehicle stops learning objectives. But there would also be a CM in there, which is a communications. There would also be a learning objective in there for um, possibly a de-escalation learning objective. There, there would be a learning objective in there for um, uh, legal understanding and application. So our instructors truly are so well-rounded. Granted, at the very beginning, um, there was a little bit of pushback because people are very comfortable in what they do and, and they don't like change but now they see how integrated everything is that they instruct. And they know that that instructor over there, you know, in a class two weeks ago, started talking about communications. I'm going to pick up on it when I start talking about vehicle stops. So it is truly a flow. And what, those, those ribs that existed on that fishbone exercise of mine, if one of the ribs dealt solely with communications and somebody else taught it before that class came up, that rib wouldn't need to be discussed or it could just be reinforced because it was already introduced. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir, thank you. You're very welcome. <clears throat> yes, please go ahead. So my name is Gordon Roy from the Cyber Center of Excellence. Um, so my question is, is at the, at the Cyber Center of Excellence, uh, the cyber school has totally moved towards a topic-based uh, approach to writing their lesson plans. So while the signal school is focused on task-based lessons, um, so hearing that you guys have uh, implemented topic-based or outcomes-based learning with topics and embedded inside of your, your curriculum is great. Uh, we know that it works over on the cyber school side of the house. However, we, we've run into some challenges in the, in the part that since they don't use task, being able to link that to collective task inside of our training systems. Um, have you guys had any issues with, in your curriculum, having to use an existing system and being able to link back to collective task when you're using outcomes-based or topic-based training to where you don't have the ability to put task or, or topics inside of your training system or your database? This is a really great question. I love this because um, whenever you transition to outcomes-based education, it's really transformative. It's not something you can just tweak. And so it has to be systemic, right? And I think we probably have answers from multiple panel members here. Um, J Jack, you want to start? And then we can move to the folks that did the cyber stuff too? I do. I, I, I will tell you, one of the problems we have I think in, in at the COE is also at Grand General Staff College and the War College, is that we have too much material for too little time. So we have a 30 pound bag and 50 pounds of stuff to put in it. And we keep getting told you need to teach this topic, that topic, this topic. Let's do a little bit more about China. Let's do a little bit about this. And the difference between outcomes-based education and input-based education, it's not topic driven. It's driven based on the end state of the graduate when, they, when they're done. What is it they can actually do? And it's more coherent rather than those discrete individual tasks or to demonstrate these discrete things they can do. It's how they put them all together in the end state. So I really resist the idea that outcomes-based education is the same as topics education. It's, that's not the focus. The focus is what is the end state of the graduate and how do they put it all together? And the way we measure that is by having capstone exercises or capstone events that put together multiple topics or multiple capabilities into one coherent capstone which can be an exercise or it can be a paper, but it shows in a paper that you have the ability to write, you have the ability to demonstrate some knowledge about this topic. Uh, you can also show critical and creative thinking, but you pull it all together. And that paper that you may be writing is an authentic assessment, looks like it you'd have to do in the real world. So if you're gonna leave here and become a staff officer, leave the Commander General Staff Officer course, 
you may be told by a general officer, I want you to write a, a staff paper for me and do a study and provide a recommendation to me. The authentic assessment doesn't take those discrete topics and teach it. It says, how do I pull this all together and do something that's assessed that looks exactly like, where I, what, like I'm expected to do upon graduation? That's a different mindset. Now, what happens is to get that mindset, you have to teach those topics sometimes. Sometimes I have to talk about the mechanics of writing. Sometimes I have to kind of help give you some techniques about doing critical and creative thinking. I might have to teach you some, something about the content of what you're writing on. But outcomes-based education pulls it all together where it's coherent and it's an outcome and it relates to the end state of what the graduate, you know, what a graduate can do, what they know, and what their attitudes are. So I, it, I think you, I, I, don't, I don't like the way you characterize that because that's not exactly what we're doing. We're saying it's an end state. The idea being it's the same thing in the military where you have there's a, there's a uh, you know, what's the what's commander's initial intent? purpose, key tasks, and end state. End state's what, the ex what it looks like at the end. You've got certain key tasks that you're expected to do along the way, and you have a purpose for the, for the reason. What is, what is the most important? Well, meeting the purpose, what you want to do, overarching purpose, is say, okay, this is why we're doing this operation. Here's the end state, what it looks like. Those, those key tasks that you're supposed to do, you know, I, can, I can ignore those key tasks as long as I accomplish the end state. I can also package them the way I want to. So we, we see this a complete shift away from it, and it helps us to get more bang for the buck in the classroom. The problem is you'd be very creative about how you do it, because if you break it down by complete topic analysis, you don't put it to coherent whole, and your assessment doesn't support that, then I don't think you're really doing good outcomes-based education. You are doing some topic education. Yes, Jackie? Yeah, I, I want to follow up on that. Um, so I think, Dr. Kim, that this... Um, maybe misalignment in terms of what you're saying, like we need to have a shared design language of like what is outcomes versus what is competency-based. So, sir, to your point, um, uh, here's a heuristic I found uh, the hard way uh, by working with um, our, my, our cybersecurity faculty was, was excellent, but um, I didn't have the language, right? And so one of the things that we did is something very simple is going from nouns to verbs. So when when we present things as topic-based, I hear topic equals noun. And as Dr. Kim said, but that's not what outcomes-based or competency-based, I think that's weird. The end state is a, um, it's not it's not a state of being. It's, yeah, and end state is a noun, yeah. which is what, you know, what a graduate can do. They can do these things. The way you get to them is by a verb, to be able to do certain things. That's yeah. to be able to do this particular competency, right. to accomplish this particular topic. Yes. And so on my on my chart that I had to the right were nouns. What's in the middle were verbs. Right. That helps. Yes. Thank you. So as you're working uh, bridging the gap between I think these two different models, and when you're working with faculty or when you're working with learners who are transitioning, um, you know, asking them, okay, let's what what are the verbs that we want them to do? Maybe that outcome uh, and in cybersecurity because the, the tools themselves or the tiny tasks change so frequently. Um, so you kind of have to be a little bit vague, but then build in, and I think this is the creative part Dr. Kim is talking about, that there might be multiple ways. So you might be making a model or writing a paper or um, doing a particular task analysis where the details aren't spelled out, that they're kind of loose so that you can adapt them and be agile if a tool changes or a protocol changes or you know the joint chiefs say we don't use this i don't know do opera anymore uh a technical term uh so i, I if if that if that helps <clears throat> Somebody has to back, back that into training so the CDC 
database, because that's the only way trade off will recognize my training and give me the resources I need to train the best team. I think that was what the, no. the question was. No, and I agree with you. You know, in, in this building, TDC is a four-letter word. It's a four-letter word everywhere. Yeah, it, it, particularly for us, you know, it's a four-letter word. And TDC, you know, and having, because TDC just uh, justifies your, your POI and justifies resources. And, and, uh, and it breaks things down to all its constituent parts to make sure everything's all covered. In. And it is an ancient, archaic system, which, which uh, unfortunately, I don't have to deal with a whole lot because I'm a degree granting institution, at least in, in uh, Command and General Staff College, and the War College doesn't have to do it, but everybody else does. And I understand that's a problem, and how you have to lay that out is problematic. I also will tell you that I think we've been doing outcomes-based education for years. This is nothing new. We have always said that the, we want to look and see what a soldier or an officer or a warrant officer can be no do uh, when they graduate. That goes back to 22100 back in 1998, you know, the be no do approach. So there's nothing new in the sun of this. It's just an approach. And we're trying to, at least it goes back to, uh, to, to 2000, I believe it was 18, Terry Mattis said that uh, PME has stagnated. He was saying, we have gotten ourselves so weighed down with all these requirements back and forth, and you're not able to move very quickly and be, and be quick. And so some of this is to try to, to, unleash the hounds and say, okay, let's quit adding all these individual pieces that had to be tested. But but it's it's a struggle and it's a struggle for us. I know it's a struggle even more for the COEs uh, and it's a struggle for all to say, okay, we're worried about what the graduate can do upon graduation and how we get there should not be tied to a bunch of topics and, and discrete things to teach. But I realize that, you know, I answer emails all the time from Congress that says, how are you teaching X and how are you teaching this particular thing? Did two of them yesterday. And so uh, our stakeholders also are demanding that we do these things all the time. We're trying to break free of that. Do we look at outcomes? They're also, just as Jacqueline said, you know, we, we struggle with the terminology because the terminology between competency-based education and outcomes-based education are terms of art. There's no real science to it sometimes because it depends on who you ask. You ask 14 educators, you get 15 opinions about what those things actually mean. And we're trying to get those things together. But I think the key is the authentic assessments and the key goes into assessments. How you assess those things and how you assess those things in, in, in a real world situation and what the person can actually do upon graduation is what the stakeholders are demanding. The stakeholders out in the forest are saying, hey, I want uh, people who can read and write. I want people who can think. I want people to do this. They're not looking for people who just know about this one discrete topic. They want to know how they can put it together and perform when they get to their job. And that's what outcomes-based education is going to do, to, to make the graduate what the, what the consumer or the, uh, the commanders in the field, what they want when they get an officer or they get a student. And that's kind of where the shift is. But it's going to take us years to get there. And it's going to take us years to get there here at Manager General Staff College. And I know the COE is going to have even more struggles and TDC is going to weigh you down. And, and, and I understand that. And, and trust me, TDC, you know, I, I approved the curriculum for the SAR Managers Academy in TDC as a TDC manager. And I have to go through all that while I'm trying to also implement outcomes-based education at SAR Managers Academy or SAR Managers course. And, and, you know, I'm talking at both ends of my mouth at the same time. It's very difficult. So hopefully that kind of tells you some of the challenges that we all realize are there. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, for us over at the Cyber Center of Excellence, we, you know, we're doing the topics-based training uh, the same way that the gentleman on the end was talking about over at the law enforcement, to where a topic is not taught inside of a silo. It's not inside of one lesson. It's over multiple lessons. So at the end, when we get to the outcomes-based assessment, that's where we assess whether or not that has taken place. So it may be taught throughout the entire module or, or course. It just depends on where we're, we're gonna finally assess that. But I think that the big issue is, is that there needs to be an enterprise solution on how we're gonna be able to tie this in, in, into our existing systems, knowing that we're going to ATIS right now, because one of the issues that we also faced was that if we, if we create a lesson plan, we'll, we'll use the cybersecurity, for example, and we use outcomes-based training uh, approach on that, and we, we taught multiple topics throughout that. And it's not tied to, an, to a critical task, an individual critical task, but yet the intel and the, 
Intel wants to use that same lesson. And they are using critical task. How do they tie to that topic to an outcomes-based lesson if there's not a task in there? Okay, you asked multiple questions. I want to answer at least some of them. <laughs> okay, I'll answer the ones I can't answer. Uh, DOD instruction 1300.25 part one, which was just signed out a couple months ago, was signed by the, uh, the Under Secretary of Defense. And it states that all of military education will fund our outcomes-based education. And so we now have a forcing function and it says military education, not PME, but military education. So it includes all the functional courses as well as the PME courses. It says we'll use uh, outcomes-based military education and it defines outcome-based military education the same way I define outcomes versus objectives. And they also reinforce that there's some cross-cutting issues that must be taught in all military education, which includes critical creative thinking, oral and written communications, uh, team building and uh, strategic thinking. All those are cross-cutting issues that need to be taught in all of the curriculum. So there at least is, is now something to hang on to say, okay, we've been doing outcomes all along. It's, it's not about teaching discrete topics, it's about what the product looks like and what the product can do. Now, the, the question is, how do we get that to promulgate down lower and lower where it's, because I, I realize that we have a, you know, you have a critical, uh, critical task site selection list. Uh, I'm not tied to that, that system, but you are. And so we need to have that system re-looked at. Uh, you know, we produced the Dash 7 and Dash 14 in Army University, trying to shift those also where they address the idea about what's being used in, uh, in, in outcomes-based education. So it's not quite as um, as prescriptive to uh, to loosen you up. We're in the middle of the rewrite for the Dash 7 and Dash 14, uh, the 357 Dash 14 and 357 Dash 4 Dash 7, which belong to Army University. And as Chief Academic Officer, I'm trying to work on those things. Uh, but you know, we have all kinds of help that uh, have different ideas of how things need to be done. But but I hear you, understand the problems, and I understand that there's a lot of tasks that are that are given to you. And I understand that resourcing is tied to it very closely, uh, particularly in the way the TDC gonculator works that says, if I teach this task, it takes this much time, which requires this many uh, faculty members, which is how you're authorized on your, on your, uh, your TDA. And there's no really, there's no system to replace that right now. And so we are tied to that somewhat because of the way the resourcing model is derived and how we do the trap and SMDC process. But all those processes, you know, we're trying to get those things lining up and trying to slowly shift them where they can look at it more holistically as opposed to break it into all these pieces and parts. Did that can, can I give you an answer? Okay, thanks. Uh, actually, I think Keith has an online question for us. <clears throat> yeah, I have one from Christine Parker online. Uh, how can we thereby considering our course maps as a cognitive apprenticeship framework that supports expert thinking by novices essentially using them to move student uh, to more expert engagement within uh, the content, or is it intended to be an assessment tool versus delivery setup tool? Oh, that's an excellent question. So, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, chomping at the bit. Um, so one of the reasons that I love maps is um, that they are both um, an artifact um, of a research question, um, and they're also a method of analysis. So to answer the, um, the uh, person's question, they are both, and there is not one map to rule them all. Um, and we found that um, working with uh, Scott and the KLTC folks, um, we were tasked to map the curriculum and we ended up with four very different visualizations, and I'll, I'll call them maps loosely. Um, and so the question is, um, what ev every map has to tell a story. It can tell a different story. And what's its audience? So you can have a map for assessment. Um, you can have a map for teaching. You can have a map that shows um, development across a career field. And so uh, I would say that um, it is not a one size fits all. Um, it's good to start with a question um, or something that's not working or something that you don't really understand um, and start from there. And uh, and that's kind of the nice thing about maps is that um, 
a map is a set of symbols, it's not the topography, right? So you have to pick and choose. It's, um, it's not completely objective. You have to choose what you want to focus on. Um, but through make, creating that map, you or your team or you're in your program has a much better understanding of what the mission is or what the goal is. Uh, she just responded, uh, I'm truly intrigued by this cognitive apprenticeship theory now. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Excellent. Yes, there's a question here in front. Um, Dr. Brown from the engineer school. One, one of the things that um, I think I'm hearing that I see as a challenge for us is the one factor that's a consistent across our courses is that our faculty is not um, it's not seasoned in instruction. It is these are transient instructors who are with us for a couple of years. They get a couple of weeks of of initial training to start with, and so pushing them beyond a task framework, pushing them to an outcomes-based um, understanding is a challenge for us. How do you see our faculty in, um, training maturing in a way that makes them better able to do these things like incorporate critical thinking better, um, that whole, that whole um, spectrum that you mentioned that we should be incorporating um, when in some cases we feel like we're doing the best we can to get them to a to training the tasks that are required of a of an MOS or of a of a career field. So obviously, uh, you know, the uh, common faculty development uh, program that's developed by Army University. The intent by one of the intents for Army University was to create a common standard for all the faculty. Also, so we had different uh, faculty development programs throughout the Army, and coming up with a CFD program that basically had three uh, TLOs. You know, prepare to teach, teach, and also assess uh, was the intent of an 80-hour instruction so we could have kind of a commonality across the board. I think we've accomplished that uh, reasonably well across uh, the enterprise, and I think that's working okay in terms of having that common standard. Uh, the next level is how we uh, could look at that piece that's the assessment piece, which I think is the hardest part, and it's the hardest part to actually teach. And inter-rater reliability to make sure that how we assess that what's assessed in one group is the same which assessed in another. And so we, we are making progress on that. I will tell you that Matt's department that he has at uh, Department of Command and Leadership here at uh, Command Joe Staff College and Department of Military History are probably the very best about having the inter-rater reliability where they sit and talk and have a shared understanding of exactly what a B looks like, an A looks like, uh, aided by rubrics that have been developed by the faculty that said, here's the word picture that defines exactly what kind of a grade you should give. And I think that's working well. And, and that has a combination of the faculty that stay here a long time, the Title 10 faculty, plus the rotating faculty, the military faculty. But, but I believe we're making progress and, and you know, we've been charged to look at that closer, how we can have those things tied together. The other thing that's nice about the program learning object, program learning outcomes is, you know, the intent is for them not to change every year. We ought to kind of have a common standard of what we expect a graduate of any course to have that doesn't change year to year to year. We may change some of the terminal learning objectives. We may change some of the classes, but the outcome, you know, what a pilot does is, is not changed dramatically. Maybe the aircraft has changed, maybe some other things, but you know, there's some things we expect people to do that shouldn't change. And so there's a mindset saying, let's give some flexibility internal and let the faculty take charge of that. And the faculty work that out better. But, but we have a ways to go. We have a ways to go in here at uh, Command General Staff College. I know the War College also struggles this to some extent. And I, and I know you have down at the uh, COEs where all of your faculty is rotating uh, for the most part, not all, but, but uh, most COEs rotate, rotational faculty every two or three years. I think the answer is to empower that faculty and to make sure we have common faculty development that continues throughout the whole enterprise and then start this process. That, probably not a great answer, but that's the idea. And Matt, maybe you can talk about how you do it in DCL. So I, I would start off with the the uh, traditional joke that every every first year teacher uh, thinks they should give their salary back uh, after they've been teaching a few years and and all the things that they have learned. Um, I, I would, in addition to that, offer that um, setting expectations for you know for first year instructors based on on their their capabilities, um, aligning them with with topics and subjects that they're 
that they're uh, fit their skill set um, are are big. Th so I do get to do our new faculty instruction. We have a process for onboarding uh, faculty that I think uh, is is a uh, where the where the new faculty member after we introduce them to the the classroom technology and how everything is supposed to work and then how uh, to respond when it doesn't work uh, and then they teach a they actually have to teach the class to uh, to a group of, of instructors that have been around for a while and we try to get a um, uh, a broad range of experience in that but I, I think just developing expectations for you know for um, instructors as they go both structurally uh, you know what they do and then what they don't do in terms of extra duties creating the conditions where they can also um, enter in as as um, as co-learners in that and and distinguishing between the training tasks the things that that are uh, measurable with performance in terms of you know things you can see and then what I, I suggest we we teach when we're doing it really well or we teach the behaviors attributes competencies that are predictive of success at the at the next level for us it's the transition between from the direct level of leadership to the organizational level, where they have to think about time and space differently. They have to think about how, not just communication, but how the communication flows in order to uh, create the conditions. When we talk about ethics, it's not just your ethical decision making, but how do you, how do you um, mobilize the members of the organization at the lowest? So, so really thinking about that, um, and the, the onboard selecting recruiting instructors is also, a you know, how do we get people who are, um, who this is a good fit for? I, and I think, so when you start with that, and I, I would think that um, one is you have to like students to teach well. I mean, you have to appreciate, you have to appreciate their skills. And we teach highly competent students. Our students are, are, are very competent, but that which, enabled facilitated their competence at one level may in fact uh, if without change cause them problems at the at the organization level so you know so how, how do we have those discussions uh, I, I don't know um, I would just offer that as just some things to consider perhaps there's a really lovely book by bell hooks called teaching critical thinking um, she's a feminist pedagogue so it might be a little outside of uh, the regular wheelhouse. Um, but the way that it is organized is quite interesting, especially for new uh, instructors. And it's written from like a higher ed um, perspective, if that helps. Hello, oh, you can hear me. Uh, hi, I'm Captain Steven Terry. I have the honor of working with the Vice Provost of Academic Affairs Office here um, on the installation. And so my question is more about a, a little bit about accreditation. And so I think of HLC criteria and four, which is on teaching and learning and how do you, in an outcomes based educational environment, how do you go about assessing knowledge acquisition if it's not task based in accordance with like an HLC criterion? HLC does not look at that very closely, honestly. HLC looks at what we're meeting our stakeholders requirements. They look at how we're doing assessments and they uh, look and see if we've done a crosswalk on our assessments. And so I will tell you that uh, that standard for HLC is one of our least problems. Just that's what our hardest problem is standards two and three and the joint staff, which has to do with, you know, the, the things we are being uh, told we have to teach. But, uh, you know, honestly, that has not been a problem with HLC. And I don't think it's been a problem for the institutions that are here in this, this region. It's not a problem for the University of Kansas. I know that. So, so you know, they, they don't really, HLC looks to make sure you have a system that's set up. They make sure that you have your faculty that are qualified, that you have an assessment program, that then you have the right kind of facilities, you have the right kind of funding. But they don't really get into your chili in terms of, uh, of what it is you teach and what your stakeholders are demanding. And uh, they do look and see to make sure that for a, a master's degree, it's at least 30 hours and it's got, you know, this kind of a faculty that teaches it and it's got this kind of progress, uh, progression and sequence. But uh, they don't really get into exactly what it is you teach. Uh, it's normally the secondary accreditations to do that, the business school accreditation, the joint, joint staff, those kind of things. That help you? Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman over here on the left. Go ahead. Hi, um, Chaplain Roy Myers. I'm the dean for the Chaplain Graduate School. Um, this is kind of a nuanced question. I think Dr. Dudek probably 
for you more than anyone else. But um, so what I'm interested in is any theorists or anybody who's doing some work in shaping of the learning environment. I, I love the mention of bell hooks there. It was, that's awesome. Um, but I, we're, what we do is we certify SI7 Romeo chaplain clinicians or specialists in spiritual care and then spiritual care educators. Um, very nuanced kind of program. In the process of creating them, we're really more concerned with their behaviors and their attitudes than knowledge. And in fact, knowledge is almost ancillary to most of what we do in our process. Um, therefore, what we're really, really focused on is shaping of the learning environment. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you have any theorists or anybody who's doing some work in that area, because so much of what's going on everywhere else is really about the knowledge is the entryway. For us, it's the behavior. What we want is a chaplain clinician to walk in a patient's room and do good spiritual care. And very rarely does that touch, I mean, it bring, they bring their knowledge in with them, but it's all about their behavior and about their attitude when they're in the room. So I don't know anything you have to say that would be helpful. Oh, there's so many. Um, so I, I'll, I'll get with you and uh, give you a long list. Although, um, I mean, there's so much work in social, uh, socio-emotional learning. And I think also um, Scott could also speak to this in, in a way that, um, you know, Scott, your curriculum has, has done a lot with uh, public trust and like the behaviors of dignity and, and kindness. Um, there's, uh, Bell Hooks is one, there's the, the work of Thich Nhat Hanh, who's not necessarily a theorist, um, but out there. And then um, I think communities of practice. So Lav and Wenger, could also be applied. And there's lots of elements of cognitive apprenticeship, like the, the social part, um, the community part that could be used in service of affective and behavioral things. The only thing I would add to that is that um, at, with, with our training model that we recently undertook, we have pushed, pushed a lot more emphasis towards um, resilience. And um, as far as specific authors, I, I've just relied upon training that I've had in the past to help build the program. We have people on staff that that are, you know, from other agencies that they they may have been in a resilience capacity, a coaching capacity. We use those folks to help push that on to our students to help them understand that, you know, when they retire from the profession of policing, they don't need to be a, a used up um, shell. They need to look forward to something and and to work through the things that they have to work through while they're on duty and just the every everyday life experiences of a police officer. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we have just a minute for maybe one more question. Um, go ahead. Okay, this question's uh, regarding the experiential learning model. Um, so I, I know that this morning we talked about the fact of, of trying to get away from the one size fits all. And for a point of clarity, is that just one example? I know that we're directed to use experiential learning, but there's more than one experiential model out there. Was, is that just one of the models that we could use to get to out, outcomes-based training, or do you guys have some recommendations for other models that could be used? So in that, <clears throat> that wasn't an intent to be uh, essentially prescriptive. The specific example that I that I put up there was um, was was how I, it's from a course uh, that I teach on resilience, my, my elective, uh, and it's just an example with a CE that causes discussion and then, and then uh, moving into the theory uh, and then the, the develop and then the apply. So um, it's not, it's within that, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a framework, a model, <clears throat> not intended to be a one, I don't think intended to be a one size fits all. In fact, Experienced instructors don't have to start in any one domain, and that that is emphasized in the uh, as we uh, as we learn about it, as we uh, and then we reblue when we go through uh, faculty development. So um, I I would suggest that it is a it is a a framework that um, is supported by uh, you know by the years that we've had in uh, in in using it here and the outcomes that have been. Uh, that are are measurable, uh, but not a one size fits all. Um, I, I think within that there are other points, and as I sat through the same thing, was thinking about the uh, when it was described uh, when Trump Martin was talking about the the lecture based moving away from the lecture based uh, to a, a 
a approach that is, and there's lots of literature uh, to support that uh, a student-centric approach for adults uh, who are self-managed and, and creating the desire to learn is, uh, is more effective. So, and it, uh, if I can add to that, you know, the, the, the cold model, which has a concrete experience, publishing process, generalize new information, develop and apply, is the standard model that's taught in uh, FTP and the CFTP1. It is the, uh, the way that you're supposed to develop curriculum. Uh, and, and it's the way that we teach people as a model of how to do a faculty instruction. But we don't have an expectation that you will follow that down to the T. We have an expectation you will understand that model. You'll understand how that applies against the different learning styles uh, that we have based upon the learning styles inventory and that uh, you'll use something similar to that, but, but, it's, but it's not intended where you have to follow that model step by step by step by step by step. In fact, uh, I probably never did that when I was in the classroom for many years, but I did understand the process. I understand there's some people who are divergers and some who are convergers and some who are assimilators, and that provided me a way of thinking about how I was teaching. And also that I try to reinforce in all the FTP classes about the importance of the develop question, which Matt talked about, which is which relates to the transference of the information, you know, the transference of the knowledge. You know, are you going to use this in the future? That, that second person open-ended question, which I think is absolutely essential. But it is not dictated that that's the way you have to teach. I think the dictation is that's the way curriculum is developed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we need to wrap it up for um, making learning visible. Um, I just want everyone to know that um, the panelists here will be around for a little bit if you have questions. Um, and I also wanted to, first of all, thank, thank the panelists here for your time and expertise. Um, I appreciate I appreciate you being here, and I'd also like to thank the Army University for hosting the symposium, and the Center for Certification and Competency-Based Education for allowing me to moderate. Um, thank you all for being here and participating. Um, it was a real honor for me um, to be here, and I um, just want to thank you all for your participation and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. Thank you. Um, if I could, can I have one of the panel members come up here? I've got a question online that we'd like to get answered. Sure thing. Go ahead. Thank, thank you. Who, who did it come to? Let me just. Yeah, sorry. Can you read it oh, off to us? Okay. Uh, Jared Bice says, how do you provide a clear workload and compensation model based on the learner's needs for engagement and motivation? And he continues on with, student-centered approaches to learning might require resources and time that each organization might not have. Burnout can occur over a long term for the learner if there is an end state that doesn't motivate that learner. Can you repeat just the front end of it real quick or summarize yes. that? How do you provide a clear workload and compensation model based on the learner's needs for engagement and motivation? TDC and, and there's no other viable alternative for that. TDC is the model that actually outlines uh, the resource model and there's uh, no other alternative that I know of today in the training environment. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about like how is experience like how is different than like different things that are on the field or like getting materials and like making things out of it. Oh, to you. Sorry, who so we have to make the learning very, very, very much the same.
This one right here. Or just okay. there. Uh, go ahead and play the video, would you please?
Okay, Army credentialing programs. Uh, that concludes our brief. We'll open it up for questions now. Hope you were paying attention to the video. Um, but yeah, uh, on behalf of uh, the Access Director, Colonel Julia Bell, um, I would like to introduce my team and the, the programs that we offer uh, to all eligible soldiers, regardless of what pathway they choose, uh, whether it be through uh, proponent funded or institutionally delivered credentialing that's directly aligned to the MOS, um, the United Services Military Apprenticeship Program, um, and then the, the fairly new credentialing assistance program. All these programs are voluntary. They directly tie to talent management, Army readiness, and I will tell you that the Army is leading all the other services in the opportunities that we provide the Army soldier for them to be able to uh, be set up for success while serving, um, engaging in their MOS or learning new skills, trades, knowledge, skills, and abilities um, that greatly enhances their performance uh, through their soldier life cycle but it also greatly enhances the possibility and the opportunities that they have while they transition uh, to that civilian sector. None of these programs are designed or are designed to be a transition assistance program. Uh, much like all the other voluntary education programs in the Army, um, it, it is there for the opportunity for those who want to re receive a nationally industry recognized certification, credential, or license uh, while serving or as they transition out. I have my team of heavy hitters here, all my program managers, my fire team. Um, I am going to turn it over to them uh, to brief each and every one of their programs. Uh, starting off with credentialing assistance, program manager is Ms. Sophia Sweeney. Uh, next, we have the institutionally delivered credentialing program manager, Stan Bennett. United Services Military Apprenticeship Program, program manager, Sean Morrissey. And then from SOLID, we have a senior analyst uh, that's going to discuss the gap analysis used when we're talking about certifications, credentials, and licenses that you will find on the COOL website that's used to support all of our programs within the Army. So with that, uh, Ms. Sophia Sweeney, credentialing assistance. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Can I get the slides, please? Nope. Next slide, please. Okay, there we are. <laughs> okay, so just want to talk a little bit about the credentialing assistance program. Uh, credentialing assistance program is an actual uh, retention program, and it uh, definitely enhances soldiers' abilities and their knowledge. It also helps soldiers who are transitioning out of the military, um, you know, with these industry-recognized credentials um, that they can move forward with when they exit the military. It is a voluntary program. It is offered to all soldiers, regardless of their rank, regardless of their component. Um, also, we have uh, vendors, right? So you'll see a lot of vendors in the um, Army Cool program or the website. Those are actually credentialing agencies, and uh, Christine will talk more about those later. But for the credentialing assistance program, we have vendors that offer training uh, or the exam or, you know, materials that will help lead a soldier to the actual credential. And we so we consider any vendor to be a college, a um, credentialing agency, a mom and pop shop, any other organization that can help uh, lead that soldier to the exam or to the credential. Next slide, please. As you can see, um, CA is authorized to, you know, for soldiers to pursue um, stuff like uh, the training, the books, the materials, uh, recertification. So if it's, and again, this none of these credentials have to be aligned to a soldier's MOS, okay? And soldiers can request multiple credentials. As they could be sequential if they, you know, if you're, moving that route um, but also there is no there's no like cap so you can pursue as many credentials as you want throughout your career we used to have an actual um, officers and warrant officers did incur an ad so but that there was a doty that just came out uh, in september and that removed the ad so for the use of credentialing assistance for all officers and warrant officers 
So now there is no longer a service obligation for warrant, uh, officers and warrant officers. So we do um, credentialing assistance is similar to tuition assistance. And so uh, the cap for soldiers per fiscal year is $4,000 to use towards tuition assistance or credentialing assistance. And if a soldier does fail uh, a credential or training or a, uh, an exam that they requested, they will be recouped for that, uh, for that failure. Next slide, please. So a lot of people get this confused. They think it's the Army COOL program because all the other services have a COOL program, but the Army has the Army Credentialing Assistance Program. So I wanted to kind of bring up the differences between them. So if you think about the program, that is Army Credentialing Assistance Program where soldiers can request funding for specific credentials. Army COOL is like the repository or the library. So there's no funding or anything that goes through there or any request, none of that goes through Army COOL, but a soldier uh, wants to pursue specific credentials, they're gonna find them in Army COOL. And the system in which we use for soldiers to submit their CA requests is Army Ignited. So that's the platform that they use. Next slide, please. And then we've got Army Cool, and this is where soldiers can research and do, um, you know, find whatever program they want to pursue. It is an actual public site, so anyone can uh, use this site. We have lots of um, retirees, soldiers, um, retention, you know, recruiting command uses this as well, potential recruits. Anyone can go to Army Cool uh, to search for credentials. Next slide, please. To go to the Credentialing Assistance tab to get more information about the program, you would click on the Credentialing Assist Assistance tab, either in the orange box or in the black bar. Next slide, please. From there, you can download a bunch of information. So if you're somebody that wants to pursue credentialing assistance, you can get all the information right off of this page. Policy is located here. The steps, like the actual step-by-step -step instructions from start to finish for any soldier that wants to submit a CA request. You can also find all of our approved vendors for the program. So the, if there's somebody you were thinking about or a credential you want to pursue, like, hey, I want to do PMP, um, who offers this through um, you know, credentialing assistance, you can find those vendors on the approved vendor list. Okay. Uh, also, if there's any potential vendors that want to participate or you don't see a vendor that's listed in here, you can submit that information to our team and we will request that that vendor participate um, and then, of course, that vendor will have to go through our process of vetting. And if they meet all the criteria, we'd add them to the list for soldiers to uh, request when they submit their CA request. Next slide, please. And if you just want to do a complete search or you know what it is that you want to pursue, you would just go to the full credential search uh, where you're going to find the list of all credentials. Next slide, please. From here, you're gonna see that there's uh, over 1,600 credentials. You can search by typing in the name of the credential itself or maybe the credentialing agency if you knew that, or you can just look through all of them. Next slide, please. From here, when you click on an actual link, any one of those credentials, you're gonna find a, great, a bunch of different information like you know, what the occupations are, what's the eligibility criteria, um, and other great information that soldiers want to know to ensure that they're even eligible to take or pursue those credentials or find out what it is that they need to be able to continue to move towards that credential. Uh, we always recommend that soldiers contact credentialing agencies because though we'd like to think that we know all of the credentials that are in the system, there's over 1,600. So the credentialing agency is going to be the one that actually tells you whether you're eligible or not to pursue something or if you need more training. And again, this just kind of goes over the, the requirements or the eligibility criteria. So you want to always look there to make sure that, you know, you're even eligible or, um, again, to see what, it is, what else you need to be able to sit for that exam. Next slide, please. And then from there, you can also see the related occupations. You can see you know, if you're looking for this specific credential, what is it aligned to? Because every credential has to be aligned to someone's MOS, AOC, or ASI in the, system, in, um, in the Army, right? So you can click on the Army and it'll tell you what that credential is aligned to. Or you can even click on civilian and it kind of tells you what you can do, what this job family is in the civilian workforce. Next slide, please. Yep, no. 
That's just telling you the uh, job family that's in the uh, civilian workforce. Next slide, please. And then this is, again, this is Army Ignited. This is where soldiers submit their CA requests when requesting funding for a specific credential. Next slide, please. Just wanted to show you a little bit about what, um, or you know, what we've already funded for FY21, and you can see the top five credentials that have been that were pursued in FY21, and then in FY22, just as of uh, May, we had 11,000. As of today, we have almost 14,000 CA requests in the system, and again, those are the top five credentials that are being sought after. So you can see they're kind of similar. Um, but come to you, that's, I mean, that's really huge. And PMP is really huge right now. Next slide, please. Okay, and thank you. That concludes my brief. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Mr. Stan Bennett. Hello, everyone. So in, con in uh, comparison, the institutionally delivered credentialing program is a little bit different. Some similarities, but we'll go through the differences. So the, uh, the IDC program was initiated by specified guidance in Title 10, Section 2015, that directed all DOD services to provide professional credentialing opportunities to service members commensurate with their military duties. So what the IDC program does, it offers three advantages. It offers the soldier improved professionalism because the the credentials that are offered and sponsored through the um, Army courses are um, directly related to the MOS. It offers added related knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, to the soldier because it's directly associated with the Army job. Uh, and it provides post-employment opportunities because the, the soldier is then able to um, combine their um, experience with the nationally recognized credential uh, and then therefore can find a, a higher paying job on the civilian market. Next slide, please. So these are some of the advantages of the program. Some of the things that are interesting about the program, it's, it is a program of record. It is voluntary, uh, but you'll find that, that um, more than just the fact that it's MOS related, the credentials in the IDC program actually overlap with content found in Army course curriculum that's the branch specific course curriculum. So when a soldier goes to AIT, for example, uh, if, if that soldier is in an MOS that has a civilian equivalent uh, job market, for example, there is very likely certifications or licenses related to that MOS that, that we can then take that MOS and compare it to the certification or license and we can compare the Army course curriculum with the requirements of the certification, and we can give the soldier credit for that part of the certification that they're earning by simply uh, attending the course and going through the POI, and so then we only have to uh, provide for the soldier what's left. In some cases, it's only the exam, and in that case, you know, the soldier can do it on duty uh, while they're at the school, and it's a very low cost uh, opportunity because they don't have to buy the whole credentialing package, we only have to buy what's left. This program uh, offers and awards on average of about 7,000 MOS related credentials a year and over 20,000 MOS required credentials a year. Uh, it is an on-duty professional development program and since inception uh, has awarded over 2,000 credentials to soldiers in all three compos, active National Guard and Reserve. Next slide, please. There we go. So this slide depicts how the IDC credentials are offered in conjunction with various ranks while the soldiers are attending the resident courses. So you can see from the slide, if you look on the uh, on the uh, second column in, you'll see the rank and you'll see that, for example, in the 50 series aviation MOS, this particular credential, FAA airframe and power plant is offered to E137s and warrant officer ones through CW4s. And then it's also offered in conjunction with attendants at AIT, ALC, SLC, and WOAC in this particular example. Uh, you'll see um, down near the bottom, the 89 series, that's actually a licensed forklift operator. So we do both certifications and licenses if they're directly related to the Army job. And you'll see that we have multiple ranks in multiple schools. And so in a lot of times, uh, 
this is a commandant sponsored program. So the commandant can either uh, through the through the soldier's uh, career path determine and recommend to the soldier when the best time to, to pursue this credential is either AIT or whatever, or the soldier can make this choice. So for example, if he goes to AIT and he decides he doesn't want to pursue it, then maybe 50% of the content overlaps with AIT, but he waits to ALC, maybe 80% of the content is covered in ALC, and that's the better time for that soldier to pursue that credential. Next slide, please. So I think this is this is probably the money slide. This is the key reason why the program exists and what it does for the soldier. So in this particular example, you have a 91 Bravo wheeled vehicle repair. And so the Ordnance School, what they've done is they've gone out and they said, well, look, you know, every automotive industry has wheeled vehicle repairs. Um, we're going to find a vendor, and they did, uh, the ASE uh, vendor. And they said, uh, you know, how, how aligned is what what the industry standard is for a, uh, a light wheel vehicle mechanic compared to what we do. And they said, well, it's, it's, it's so aligned that basically all you have left to do is the exam. And since you're going to, and the army said, well, since, since that's the case, we're going to offer this in bulk to the soldiers. So every 91 Bravo going through AIT is going to have a chance to get an industry standard credential an ASC tactical wheel vehicle credential. It's going to cost the army about $75 per credential. So we're cranking out about, when this thing is fully functional, we're going to crank out about 4,000 soldiers a year with certifications that are the industry standard certification directly related to their MOS. And then what that leads to on the backside, as you see in the example, then they'll be um, uh, capable of, of pursuing and, and getting jobs like a first line supervisor of mechanics, which starts out at around $71,000. Uh, another great example that we have in our program that's kicking off in FY23 is the Army Engineer School. In FY23 is going to pair with the Army Corps of Engineers to offer the professional engineering licensing exam. What this does is it professionalizes the engineer corps uh, in many ways. It promotes continued competence through continued education requirements and the median salary for the difference between uh, an engineer with a PD and, a P and without a PE with the PE is, is a starting salary of about $99,000. So you can see there's a significant difference here. Next slide, please. This is, this is kind of a, an overview of the program and you'll see on the left column, uh, different uh, categories, the domain, the policy, uh, the funding, et cetera. Well, I, I think some of the keys to this program that make it unique in terms of credentialing is that it's on duty. It's in conjunction with attendance at a resident course. The leadership inv is involved because it's a commandant sponsored program. Uh, and there's a direct MOS relationship to the content that the soldier is learning in the resident course. You have a couple of examples there at the bottom, Six, 68 whiskeys, for example, EMT certification. Uh, I think the 88 mics, because of the fact that they, they get all of that training when they're uh, going through truck driver school, uh, can have their uh, both the written and the uh, hands-on exam waived for the uh, commercial driver's license, for example, and they can just take that paperwork into the to the driver's license office and get out of CDL. Next slide, please. So one of the uh, issues that we've had with with this program is that the IDC program was handed down from the Army to TRADOC, and then TRADOC handed it down to Army University. Uh, and, and, and as that progression has occurred, uh, we, have, we have not had really solid policy for the program. And so we're, we're trying to fix that. We've developed and completed now the author's draft of a TRADOC regulation uh, that covers in detail the program um, conducted at the Army Institutional Schools. And, and that's out for action officer staffing as we speak. With uh, We're going to get comments back by the 16th of August, I believe, is the suspense on that. So if you haven't seen it, uh, it's out there. Uh, and it's, that's going to help a great deal because what we found was that in the interim, as, as schools will do, we handed them a program and we didn't hand the policy. So what did they do? They created their own policy. So hopefully this will standardize things and bring us back under a, a single umbrella. Next slide, please. Another initiative that we're trying to do, and again, this is because this is a decentralized program. 
So Sh Sean Morrissey and I at, at here at uh, Fort Leavenworth, we manage the program in terms of the funding and the policy and those kind of things from an army level, but we don't manage the program directly. The schools manage their own program. So basically every school that, that participates, and there are 14 schools participating right now, are running their own program and then they're feeding us reports and feeding us uh, budget projections and, and so forth. So uh, what we're trying to do is automate that process because uh, currently what we're using is Excel spreadsheets and, and manual labor, which is a pretty intensive process. So what, what we wanna do is increase the ability to inform the leadership uh, and increase our ability to track the expenditures and the reporting and then, and then provide, um, you know, and it, it reduce manual labor and increase our accuracy of the data. Uh, because this report does go, this is a congressionally mandated program, so every year we have to submit a report to Congress on how many uh, credentials we we awarded and how much it cost. In the last five years, our average credential cost has ranged around $460. So that's a pretty good deal, I think. And uh, we're pretty close on the automated system as well. We're actually planning to do a limited users test uh, for the first quarter of FY23, so we're getting there. Uh, subject to your questions, I'll be followed by Mr. Morrissey. Steve, this is a one slide, so you can give your finger a rest. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Morrissey, and oh. as you heard, I am the program manager for US MAP, um, the, which is the United Services Military Apprenticeship Program. Your oh wow! I didn't even see that. Switch it up. Come on up. You want to go to the last slide? I will go last. I will follow up the rear. I have your six. Awesome. Sorry about that. Um, I am Christine Loving. I work for a company called Solid Solutions for Information Design, and we actually do all of the cool data for all of the services. And we manage the Army Cool website that you have seen some screenshots of. So the solid website, or the solid website, I'm sorry, the Army Cool website uh, is basically where all of the information is housed for all of the programs that you're hearing about today. So we have information that links credentials and MOSs back to those programs. Um, Army Cool is used by soldiers, it's used by education, career, retention, and transition counselors recruiters, credentialing agencies, organizations, as well as employers. And as Sophia mentioned, it is the repository for all the credentials that are eligible for the CA funding. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about military occupation specialties, we use MOS to speak to all ranks just for ease of discussion. And we have a number of data points that we associate with those. We provide uh, a linkage to credentials, to civilian occupations, apprenticeships, as well as licenses and national exams. So when it comes to these credentials, we show the ease of attainability, as well as designators for star, skill level, skill level, and mandatory credentials. The civilian occupations, or the ONET codes, that's the job families, we show the relationship to those federal occupations. We also list a lot of other things such as career considerations, additional information that might be useful to someone who is looking into that career. We show the relationship of an MOS to apprenticeships, which includes both US MAP and the DOL registered apprenticeship programs. And then if applicable, if an MOS is related to licenses and national exams, we list federal licenses and national exams that are required for licensure by at least 25 states. We don't list individual state licenses, but we do offer any informational data that we have. Usually it's a link out to a website where they might be able to find out more information about a state license. And uh, those are available as needed, but they're not always extremely reliable. Uh, next slide, please. So for credentials, you saw a couple of these symbols on Sophia's presentation. We list all credentials that have been evaluated by the DOD COOL standards, and we have linked those to at least one Army MOS. 
we only list certifications. Certificate programs and courses are not included. So anything that doesn't meet the DOD cool standards typically is the result of training where you get a certificate of completion at the end. That's not what's considered a certification by the DOD standards. Um, so credentials that are listed on Army Cool have a number of data points. Um, in demand is one that I know was on the slide earlier, and this is used for credentials that are frequently mentioned in online job postings. This data comes from Career One Stop, which is sponsored by the US Department of Labor. The GI Bill Payment Approved Indicator is for credentials that are eligible for reimbursement through the GI Bill program. STEM credentials are related to STEM occupations. Um, we do indicate the MOS proponent funded credentials that Mr. Bennett just talked about, and also uh, credentials that are eligible for CA funding, which currently is all credentials listed. But if policy were to change, we have the ability to alter that so that it only shows for certain credentials. Next slide, please. So each of the credentials are related to an Army MOS, and we do that by using the indicators of most, some, and other. Most indicates that the credential is direct, directly related to the major duties associated with that military occupation, which is 80% or more. Some is related to some of the tasks, less than 80% of the entire military occupation. And then other is used for credentials that are related to the military occupation, but they're usually more advanced or specialized, and additional training is going to usually be required to attain those. Things that require higher education, um, such as a bachelor's or a master's degree for an enlisted soldier. Next slide, please. So this is um, an MOS summary page. This is where all of this data lives. And there is one MOS summary page per MOS that's listed on RB Cool. It contains information such as the MOS description, related credentials, related occupation equivalents, and then those other career considerations. Um, this screenshot shows the related credential table on the MOS summary page, but there are tabs across the top that show other elements that you can look through and you can click on the credentials. It'll take you to a credential snapshot page where you can read more about the credential. So it all kind of leads you through the process of selecting your credential. You can start with the credential or you can start with the MOS. Next slide, please. So this is where the analysis portion comes in beyond what we've already done here. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what this is and what this means for the soldier. Next slide, please. So we conduct what we call a gap analysis and it's displayed on Army Cool to show the alignment of Army training for an MOS to a related certifications exam topics. We capture all of the required exam topics for each credential that's listed on Army Cool and then we conduct gap analysis for one MOS against one credential. Each of the training courses for that MOS is evaluated against the exam topics, and we determine if that training meets the exam topic fully, partially, or not at all. So this slide shows an overview of what the gap analysis might show after it's finalized. This is not the format that we use, but it's just a visual. So scenario one shows all the exam topics are fully covered. And the soldier may be ready at that time if they meet the eligibility criteria to challenge that exam, and they would have a very high probability of achieving it. Scenario two shows that there are gaps. There's the shaded uh, one with the cross lines on it. That means it would be partially covered. And then the blank square, they didn't receive any training in that. So they would either have to obtain additional training, or maybe they've obtained that knowledge elsewhere, maybe on the job or somewhere else. And then scenario three shows there's a large number of gaps and the soldier may want to really think about whether they're ready for that credential or they might want to take a boot camp or some more training or maybe pursue a different credential if they're not into that right now. Uh, the goal of this analysis is to maximize credit from, from the credentialing agencies for military training as well as to identify access to resources to fill those gaps so that the soldier can achieve the certification exams. Next uh, slide, please. So how does a soldier fill those gaps? So when there are gaps, there are a few ways that they can achieve those. The first may be to self-study. There, are, um, you know, they can get free resources. They could access uh, vendor training using credentialing assistance, 
or uh, they could access the free e-learning program. There's a number of courses available there that correspond to the credentials that are listed on Army Cool. We have an indicator for that. And so that's where the soldier can take a look and see exactly which portion of the exam they need to focus on. And that way we can also give that feedback to the certification agency so that they can properly target their training and also recruit the right people to obtain those credentials. And that's where a partnership comes in and we're able to allow them to see this is all public facing so it can be used by both parties. Next slide, please. So this is what the analysis page actually looks like on Army Cool. The exam topics are on the side going down and then the training courses are across the top and the coverage is either um, full part, which is partial. And if it's blank, it means it's not covered at all. So a soldier can use this to target their studying. Again, the credentialing agency can use this to target their training and meet those gaps. And these analysis pages can be viewed by going to the MOS summary page or the credential snapshot page. There's a way, there's actually a column that says gap analysis, and it has a little magnifying glass if there is one present. So you can filter by that, sort the column, and you can view those gap analysis. Um, there is not an analysis page for every MOS credential combination. Uh, the analysis is conducted based on the receipt of POIs during the annual proponent review, and then it's prioritized. So we try to do gap analysis for credentials that are related as most, because those are going to be the most beneficial. If it's related as some or other, then likely you're going to probably need significantly more training. Um, and then the analysis is updated anytime a credential exam topics change or if new MOS training materials are obtained. So if you are a proponent and you would like to see additional gap analysis um, during the annual proponent review, which will be kicking off later this summer into the fall, you'll be given instructions on how to submit POIs. And then we will prioritize those, uh, catalog them, and then get additional gap analysis, make sure we get everything updated. So that is an overview of Army Cool and all of the data. So I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Morsey. I am the program manager for the United Services Military Apprenticeship Program, otherwise known as US Map in short. Um, how many of you are familiar with the apprenticeship program that has been provided to the Army? A show of hands, very few. That's a lot of the reason why we're here is to expand the knowledge base of what these programs are and what they provide. And the only way, we, we can only do so much social media because it only reaches so many audiences, but we really need to get the grassroots going through the communication of the schools, the commands, and to the soldier to be made aware of these programs so that soldiers can utilize them to improve their skills, knowledge, and abilities. Uh, like the other two programs, this is a voluntary program. Uh, and that is a big reason why we need ground roots assistance in this. And here's the form. That's my sales pitch. <laughs> uh, the, the program started in 1977 uh, with the US Navy. Um, and is currently known as the United Military Apprenticeship, United Services Military Apprenticeship Program. Shortly after they started, the U.S. Marine Corps uh, developed a similar program, and 20 years later, in 1999, the Navy and Marine Corps programs merged, and the U.S. Coast Guard joined in shortly after, Army joining in uh, in 2019, uh, with the Air Force closely behind. They're currently developing their program. Uh, with assistance from the other services. Um, I get over my sales pitch. Uh, in May of this year, there was a new program guide that was released and published out on the site that all users are required to, users, coordinators, and supervisors are required to um, read, understand, and implement in its entirety to ensure that uh, there's thorough familiarity for the program. Uh, as far as compos one, two, and three, they all pretty much have the same requirements of the uh, must be on active duty and enlisted, 
They must be performing the capabilities of the MOS duties, and they must have a minimum of 12 months remaining on their contract uh, to complete a program. For Guard and Reserve, they've got to be on one-year active duty orders in order to enter the program because it's not possible to get, in some cases, the total amount of hours over a battle assembly weekend once a month. So it just didn't make sense to do that unless they were on active duty orders. So that, that's the biggest distinguishing difference between COMPO 2 and 3 and COMPO 1. So what is an apprenticeship? Um, it's a formal structured training uh, program where enlisted service members, and I say enlisted and I emphasize that because we used to offer it to uh, warrant officers and never did it with officers, but they since have transitioned out of the warrant officer piece because they consider them the subject matter experts in a lot of cases that should be monitoring the enlisted and uh, validating the hours that need to be recorded for the apprenticeship. So you will only see enlisted um, in the program. Um, and basically it's an OJT. What you're doing is the Army's identified that you're already doing this work. We've got a program that allows you to record the hours of your experience and be observed by your first line supervisor um, to validate that you are doing the job in the MOS that uh, the apprenticeship is assigned. And ultimately what it does is it, it earns uh, an industry recognized credential that uh, can advance their career and assist them in much the same way as the other two programs when they do decide to transition out of the army it allows them to have a step up over their peers that are applying for the same job but aren't military a trade that's basically what it is it's the a trade is what the soldier when they do decide to transition out is what they will go into in the civilian industry that this apprenticeship uh, aligns to and uh, the industry acknowledges. Next, uh, let's see, US map, the reporting requirements. The, 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 this site is a very user-friendly site. And, and I'll start it off with that because that's why this is a one slide thing because it is that user-friendly. We rarely have any calls about complications about how to navigate the site and where to find information by the commands or the soldiers. So I, I won't read through this directly. Uh, if anybody would like these slides, just let me know. I will, this slide, I will let you know. I'll give you the site. I, we, how to report, it's, it's basically, I explained it, that soldier does their day-to-day -day activities. They can print out the work process schedule that they've been provided for the uh, apprenticeship that has categories that they must record say like a 2000 hour apprenticeship may have 10 categories that align with the MOS and the job duty the soldier's been trained on. So they got to record those, ensure that they've been observed uh, by their first line leader and concurred with, and then pass down the chain for approval down as time goes on. Um, let's see, three. So each apprenticeship requires demonstrated performance observed by the first line leader then recorded by the soldier and approved by the soldier's first line leader and the next level of leadership at the suggested level of Sergeant Major as a reviewer prior to going to the final approver of suggested a field grade officer just to ensure the integrity of the program is not being jeopardized. Because the, if, if you turn somebody loose out there, we all know if you turn somebody loose out there with a credential that they aren't properly trained in, a truck driver's license that may have been erroneously deemed, you have an issue. The government has an issue that potentially could lead to a disastrous result. So on what you see down here, uh, types of hours you can log, they, they can't log, you know, regular duty stuff like PT, desk hours, any of that, it has to be directly related and found in the work process schedule that is aligned with the MOS once again. Uh, and then there's two ways that they can record these hours is a time base, which is, and, and this is where we really need to get the emphasis at, is that the 
AIT level, when they first leave AIT, we need to get them familiarized with it and engaged and signed up for it. Uh, because they do receive credit for what they learned in their MOS. The Department of Labor gives them 144 hours credit, but they still have the total amount of hours to record in that job. And the sooner they do that, the better. And then there's the competency base for the more senior enlisted E5, E6, E7 that have already got the experience. And if they can have their first line supervisor and commander sign off on it, then they can get credit for those hours to get the same certificate that you would over time at a over a three or four year period with uh, junior enlisted. Uh, down below is what we're suggesting as the command approval process. Uh, soldier apprenticeship performs MO duties, records them, first line leader observes them, validates them. Uh, all this is done on the website. We, we suggest printing out the work process schedule so you can do it on uh, site and then take those work process schedules hours and then later put them in the system for recording and then the sergeant major or first sergeant should be the reviewer prior to going to the final approval of a field grade officer just so we can ensure that everything is in line checks off as reported by the first line leader and the uh, soldier pursuing the credential Let's see. Um, and then over to the right is upon completion of apprenticeship, soldier receives nationally recognized Department of Labor portable certificate and is considered a journey worker. And this is a distinction because while they're doing the apprenticeship, they are an apprentice. Once they leave, it is a, they are considered an entry level journey worker. They're not a level two, level three apprentice that you would normally associate in um, the civilian world, like with unions and stuff. They will work up to that once they get the job, depending on whether they go to a state level, uh, private business that's got apprenticeships or wherever that may that job may reside. Now, as of 2022, the Army has over and this is an update number because I just updated them today, 3,829 active apprenticeships. That means that people have actively signed up for the program and are currently pursuing it. Um, and we have 333, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, completions. Now those numbers seem way apart because they are, because it does take two, sometimes four years to accomplish this. So I'm anticipating in the next couple of years, we're gonna see this build up, but every month we have increased participation and increased numbers and we're building up. But again, we need assistance on the ground, grassroots level to get the message out and increase that participation. Um, we did add a lot this this year. Uh, we had 22 medical uh, MOSs that were added in, and I just announced, and I'm going to get in the signal to wrap it up. Uh, and the apprenticeship news, I just sent out an email to all the schools uh, for the addition of three newly added trades in the Cyber IT Knowledge Manager for 17 Charlie, 25 Bravo, and 25 Delta. Network Operations Specialist for 17 Charlie, 25 Bravo, 25 Delta, and 25 November, and then Technical Security Specialist for 94 Fox. And in the next couple months, I expect to be bringing out uh, another, for another 12 MOSs, seven more apprenticeships, of which one will apply to all MOSs. I can't reveal what they are right now, but be watching the next couple months. Um, that's the brief. Thank you. Hello again. You can say I had the toughest job of the entire presentation. Sometimes as a leader, you learn at a very early age to just shut up and get out of the way and let the people who really know about the program. Uh, next slide, please uh, talk about it because they are the true subject matter experts. I will tell you that the Army has seen exponential emerging growth in participation and enrollments across every program uh, that, uh, that was talked about today. And the intent was to engage you in conversation and provide awareness to you and for you, for you to take this back to your schools, uh, industry partners, academic partners, um, and, and really understand the different pathways and the different programs that are offered to our soldiers um, every single day. Here's the link to all the, uh, if you have questions uh, following the question and answer session that's, that's forthcoming, 
Um, here's who you can email to talk about every specific program. Uh, so I will ask you, is there anyone in the audience? This is a question and answer session. Um, does, it, does anyone have a question or a comment uh, regarding about uh, what was what was briefed here today? Yes, sir. We've not, there's not been discussion of that. Uh, oh, sorry. There there, there's not been discussion of that that I'm aware of. Uh, currently, we're trying to um, work, the Navy and the Army are working to get all the UICs so we can trace them down to the unit level, um, and like the other services currently do. But as you know, we are in a huge transition of systems right now, which is all got to be coordinated and brought together to meet the need and need. But no, I, I have not. I mean, in a sense, it is aligned, but it's not a mandatory to make it part of the system. That's a lot of the problem with a voluntary system that you, you just, that's why we got to get the marketing, with the grassroots word out there, because that's our bread and butter to get these programs and keep them sustained. Oh, we had we had an online question, yes, sir. And we'll go to the online question here. Question I have is: Is there data collection that shows how many of these credentials are being used by soldiers when they transition from military to the civilian civilian sector? Because to me, that's how I think you would gauge success of this program, right? You know, not, you know, we awarded this many credentials. Okay, this many were used, you know, when these soldiers transition. So, is there data collection in that sense? There is data collection that I receive from the schools quarterly that shows what MOS, what level, and what credential they obtained. But tracing that outside when the soldier transition is next to impossible unless you have Social Security number and tax documents. So yeah, yeah. The V the VA has been trying to you know wrestle this and and put this into understandable terms and across all programs that the army offers you know whether it's a credentialing program or does it when a soldier goes to school and they get a, a degree in whatever um whatever their degree is in do they actually use that and apply that when they transition out to get a job so we we are attempting to gather the gather the information and the data that for the completion criteria and then the completions of certificates and then eventually it would be extremely beneficial to see the true outcome and the value of the credentials earned or the certifications learned or the licenses earned on when they do transition out you know i, I you know that's, that's a that's a really large undertaking uh, to try to track soldiers after they retire they go through the sfl process then they either go through the VA or use their GI Bill or follow up with them, you know, as they transition out and say, did you actually use your CDL license and are you driving a truck right now? Yeah, I'm right. I understand that. I mean, yeah. that would be a good indicator of the return on investment. For the right. Money being spent right. And, on and don't get me wrong. There is data yeah. out there on the Department of Labor website, but collecting it all and making sense of it to be positive about it is where it becomes difficult. And Steve's absolutely right. It's, you can to a certain extent, but you can't be 100% positive that they're still doing it at that time. And uh, I just said, I know you have an online question. No, that's fine. But Go ahead. That lady on the right, my right, anyway, you uh, mentioned that there's uh, something coming up to show how to submit POIs for, for credentials. Could you talk about that? Yes. So there's a task order that will be issued. Um, Ms. Sweeney can give you more information. and. As part of that task order, at least in past years, it's been instructed to submit POIs for your um, your different MOSs, and then we use those when we collect the data to do the gap analysis. Good, sir. Okay, let's go to the online question. Okay, our first question is for um, our first presenter. Um, you showed that the pilot private pilot credential was the most one of the most popular is it still available and if not why not 
so the private pilot is still up there as, as far as being requested. It's still available. Um, we did do a reduction or we did reduce the amount that active, so, active duty soldiers could use uh, when pursuing the private pilot and other aviation related credentials down to a thousand from 4,000 to a thousand. Now, National Guard and Reserve still get the, four, the full $4,000 for private pilot, but if you are on Title 10, Title 32 orders, it is reduced to that $1,000. So it is still available. Yeah, and, the, yeah, and, this, and this, to follow up and just to add on to what Sophia said, you know, we're in a, a fiscally restrained environment, you know, and it have been for the last couple of years. And looking forward, Army senior leaders, you know, much like some of the other programs where they asked asked the army to tamp down you know some cost and spending because we just don't have you know unfettered resources that we can just reach into pockets and and pay for everything that we can pay for so you know it's due to the the resourcing and, and the under resourcing of, of some of the programs you had do we have another question in the audience yes sir hi i'm lyle hogan from the asa mnra <clears throat> i was curious I was curious your thoughts, um, you know, as we as we work through talent management and while I heard that um, in the conversation that this is a retention thing and then it also it, it's kind of like you were speaking about how well people can use it leaving the army. So that kind of tends to go against a, re, a retention effort. So there's some, um, you know, I think the real ROI in this is having more highly credentialed, more highly experienced people in the force. And then when they leave the army, great, they, they're going to go get a great job. I'd, I would like to see some of that. But I, we've been grappling a lot with how we compens how we could compensate soldiers differently. So if you have two, I think one was a wheeled vehicle mechanic, right? Two E4s who were wheeled vehicle, one chose not to take part of this. One chose to really be highly credentialed, highly qualified. They are not. They should not be compensated the same. In, in Lyle Hogue's book, I don't know about the rest of the army. I don't know how you guys think about this. And when we go out and get jobs in civilian life, right? We do not subscribe to that thinking. Like, oh, I have four years of college and four years of experience, so me and you should get paid the same. And I think as we continue to see challenges in the all volunteer force and main, sustaining that. Um, I was just curious, kind of some of your thoughts, is this is a wonderful program. I mean, this is awesome. I mean, compared to my little yellow books that I filled out back in the 80s of um, the uh, correspondence. correspondence courses that like lined the barracks of my, um, the walls of my barracks years ago. But um, I, I think um, there's some fertile ground with us kind of really doing some pilots with compensation differences in soldiers and not being afraid to say you're more qualified than you are you should be compensated differently just curious to your thoughts to that so something like special duty pay asi, A -ASI correct yeah th i mean how we do how we did that is could be studied yeah but i think um sure so so for background i'm currently the, in the reserves, the Kansas Senior Retention Counselor. I agree with you. There mm -hmm. are other ways to approach this. And one of them could be that a soldier, which our hugest loss is first term soldiers, right? So upon that, if they decide to get out a three year mark and they still got their uh, military service obligation remaining, and they must go to a guard or reserve unit. And if they've obtained one of these certificates to fulfill that portion of the contract. Now, this is me, Sean Morsey, Master Morsey, speaking from my foxhole, interviewing these kids. There, there's a myriad of different ways we can do that. It's getting it executed off the ground. And, you know, there's a whole legal process about it too that it needs to go through. But yeah, there are, there are ideas out there. Uh, we just need to canvas more of the retention force that probably has more ideas than just me in Kansas. Uh, and especially on the active duty side, and we, we probably should do a survey on that if they want to take that forward. I agree with you. 100%. If I could add to that, sir, um, the one thing that we do offer is uh, promotion points. 
So a soldier that does take a credential, each credential they are awarded is worth 10 promotion points for a total of 50. So there is a differentiator there. And, and I'll clarify that there currently in the regulations, you do not get promotion points for the apprenticeship program. Uh, that, now there's issues that need to be worked there if that were ever to come to fruition. But another point that you're getting at that if you get an apprenticeship, there is more than likely a credential that can be stacked on top of that as an incentive to stay in or a transition over a contract. So a second term contract. And we want to man that that's where our money is at because we get them over that second term contract more than more than likely we've got them for a third fourth and a careers so those are things that need to be looked at they need to be communicated and our sales force is the recruiting and retention they are the ones in those kids faces every day entering the front door and closing the back door and these are sales tools that need to be out there and aware of taught and directed to the soldier to make them aware yeah, I, I would add just one thing to that, though. You know, out in our force, um, if my supervisor, my NCOIC, is credentialed and cer certified and, and all these things, that is very impactful as well, right? And so, you know, this is kind of a cultural thing where I kind of went through this when we I was a part of Mick or Mick and we – this is a commission that we did the blended retirement system and how a bunch of new uh, young people were going to know, know about 401ks and there was a possible uh, deal where their supervisors and when they went to talk to them about it wouldn't have knowledge about what a 401k is. So we had to do some financial literacy training and all of that. That is as big an impact, I think, as recruiters and re I mean, re no, career counselors in this case, not it. recruiters, you know, but um, I, I was just curious as you guys' feedback, and that's kind of good. I mean, tomorrow or later on today, General Funk with a C uh, is going to be here the Talent Ma Management Task Force Director and some of his folks, and we've talked a lot about how we can do this differently. So maybe we'll get a little, one of these small group rooms and talk. Appreciate it, sir. Uh, well, we had, I think we have time for one more question. We have two online, and if we capture those, unless they let us keep going. Um, you go ahead, sir. Okay, hey, so I'm Joseph Kirby. I'm the deputy of the Ordnance School. And so we have an excellent uh, credentialing program. And I think we are leading the way. Uh, I, will, I will just adventure to say that we're leading the way. Um, so how do we compete? So we have 26 uh, enlisted MOSs mm -hmm. and, and nine one officer specialties, technical one officer specialties. And out of those, we have uh, 23 credentialing opportunities that we provide to soldiers. And so we went out of the out of you know the additional step of contacting ASC uh, for an Army unique ASC certification, and we've done that uh, with different industry partners. And so, how do we continue to do that and compete for credentialing funds as we grow the credentialing program in the Ordnance School? And so we're using US Map as well, uh, and so we also have capable uh, opportunities uh, similar to US Map, but they're unique. You need to know. But my question is, as we grow those, as we grow credential opportunities, how do we continue to compete for funds uh, for the numerous so amount of soldiers that we train in the ordinance school for over 30 uh, enlisted MOSs and nine one officer specialties to allow us to credential those soldiers uh, at the rate that we should be uh, doing? And, and, and keeping keep in mind that we have several MOSs that require a credential, a credential in order to perform their duties. Yes, and those are the mandatory credentials. And the other ones that we provide in IDC are the ones that stack on top of that as a soldier, which becomes a stackable credential, which if you trace back could be, you know, should have started an apprenticeship, becoming three credentials stacked. Um, we do have the scenarios and you are the leader of all proponents. And the reason why you're the leader is because you were the test pilot in 2014. You have got the knowledge base that should be applied across all proponent schools, as far as I'm concerned, as the model. You, you guys hold the key. That's why you're number one. That's why you're the highest producer of all schools. And there, there are ways to approach this. It's just we, we just got to get off the ground. I, COVID yeah, you, you got into the you got into the game early, but as we all know, as a resource constrained environment, all you can do is advocate for those credentials 
you know, through the web cool box process, for the emerging growth requirements, through all those things, making that viable and visible to the people who are making the decisions of funding and determining how all that's going to shake out and how much um, risk versus reward on what is going to get funded and what isn't. And the mandatory credentials are not managed by us. That's given by Big Army. They they are the ones that that manage those funds and push those down, you know, to the schoolhouses for those mandatory credentials. So the voluntary credentials, if you if your commandant or anyone has some of those things that are, you know, mostly aligned or that your commandant wants to incorporate into your schoolhouse, uh, it would just be putting in the time, effort, and energy to say these are the credentials that we want and this is what we require the funding for. Yeah, so, so that's that's what I'm speaking of. Yeah. Those are those ID in the IDC yeah. that we're continuing to continuing to grow that um, we're probably outpacing that we will outpace the funding yeah. as we continue to grow those. Go yeah, ahead, I, I would I would add to that too sir too sir just be aggressive with your with your forecasting with and with with recording and, and annotating um, the credibility, the, the 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 benefits that you're getting out of that program, because every year, for at least the last three years, we've actually turned back money in at the end of the year because other schools who have thought they wanted to do a credentialing program over forecasted, and then and then we had that money that we couldn't couldn't use. So in those instances, we have had schools be aggressive enough to come to us and say, "Hey, we under forecasted. Um, you know, we we have a backlog of." who was a quartermaster, I think, they had a backlog of something like 1,600 soldiers waiting for the certified logistics associate. And so we took money from one school that wasn't using it and gave it to them, and, and we filled that backlog. And, and you can do the same thing because, like I said, every every year for the last three at least, we've turned money back in to the TTPEG. But, but the, finally, answer your question overall is new emerging credentials is what I think you're addressing, like the ASC. So for that to be palmed, we need to be involved at the ground level and aware of the program so we can track and do our projections and converse with you so we know what to expect over a five-year period, three really, so we can get that in the palm so by the time you're full force over a phase period of 10, 20%, up to 100%, whatever that may look like in a voluntary program, we're already ready for it in the, from the palm process. So ground level involvement with IDC office is the key. You good, sir? Okay, uh, we, we've gone five minutes over time. I greatly appreciate everyone's uh, questions, feedback, attention, uh, and last but not least, please give uh, the subject matter experts and the program managers a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>